construct and operate. And that operate portion is very important because that means they're here for the long term. And uh, we want very much look for a partner. We look for fully assembled development teams, those that have experience in doing this type of project. Um, have those relationships and the funding. That's very important for a project this size because typically these projects are not, you know, are largely equity financed and that relationships are extremely important in the uh, equity markets. And then somebody that can execute immediately because, you know, I, I think we share our, our vision to move quickly on this as possible. So some of the time I talked a little bit about the market research and the pre-marketing. Uh, we issued the RFP um, over the last, uh, say, two months, uh, a little bit delayed with the COVID. Uh, we've been discussing some due diligence items with uh, uh, our, our friends here sitting at the dais, and um, we're now at the MOU stage. Um, and is this where the magic yes. comes? So we're gonna, Katie did this. So I'd like to introduce to you American Life. Uh, Katie's gonna do a little more of an intro than I am. But tonight's about the MOU, uh, MOU um, to enable us to move forward in a development agreement, which is the details um, for uh, moving forward. Of course, then you go through design, construction, and then operating. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Katie. So, so this brings us to our development partner, um, American Life's president, Mr. Greg Steinhauer, has created a portfolio of projects that speak to his core competency of integrating mixed use projects near stadiums that host professional sporting events. Uh, Greg's gonna share a little bit about his company and his team. And on that note, part of his team, we have Arthur Chang, who's here as well. He is the director of design for Freiheit Architecture. And Arthur has worked with American Life on a number of significant projects and with his team has created a vision that incorporates the elements of the broader P83 district. And we wanted him here tonight to kind of share with you some of that vision uh, in the design. So with that, I wanted to hand it over to Arthur, I mean, excuse me, to Greg and let him talk a little bit about his team and about uh, who American Life is. Do you wanna give that Thank to Arthur? You. you can or you can. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Honorable Council members. members. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. My name is Greg Steinhauer. I'm president of American Life. Uh, myself and my wife Debbie behind me, we are uh, Seattle refugees. <laughs> uh, we just spent uh, 22 hours driving down from Seattle and we are making uh, Arizona our permanent residence. So we're committed here for the long run. Um, American Life is, a, for now, we're a Seattle based real estate developer. Uh, we've had a This meeting will now come to order. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Vinsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Hunt. Here. And Council Member Dunn. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of August 18th, 2020. The consent agenda consists of one item, and that is authorization to hold an executive session. I have received no requests for removal from the council. Do I have a motion? Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, council, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now adjourn to executive session.
what we're going to bring to the table with the project and just create that much more energy. So uh, we're living in a very interesting time as we all know and we think it's actually gonna help us, uh, not hurt us because we see this as a, what's gonna happen in our belief is that people are going to wanna move out of the West Coast cities, Seattle, LA, uh, San Francisco, and develop nodes of office tenants, that type of thing, or there's plenty of tenants here. Uh, on our team, we have the best ag uh, commercial agent here in uh, the Phoenix area, and then uh, we've also partnered with our longtime agents out of Seattle who brought in many tech tenants. So we have exposure to all the tech tenants and the local knowledge here. So we're just very excited about the opportunity. And with that, I will turn it over to Arthur. Arthur and I have worked together uh, since we both had hair 30 <laughs> years ago. Um, Arthur won't say it, but, but he's, a, he's a brilliant architect. He has a degree in uh, aer aeronautical engineering and a master's degree in architecture from Columbia. And uh, just, I, I throw my hands up like this and say, Arthur, how about if we do this? And then he comes up with the ideas and makes them work. So thank you very much, Arthur. Yeah, we're gonna do enough lives someday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Greg. Um, I'm really excited about this project and I could probably talk about it all night long, but I've been told to keep it to the high level stuff. So that's what I'm gonna do tonight. Um, these are slides that we put together when we interviewed for the project. And uh, one of the things that we talked about when we interviewed are the three most critical things that drove, drove our project. And we think these three things set us apart from most of the other people developing or proposing to develop at this site. Um, I think at now looking at the title that we have on the slide, I would change it from design goals paramount to economic success to goals paramount to long-term economic success. In 28 years that I've known Greg, he's always been visionary in trying to think ahead and try to plan for something that other people don't see. And we've seen it in all the projects he's done in Seattle, and this project is no different. One of the key things of the three points I'm gonna make is that this project needs to be a catalyst for the future growth. And we're not just talking about the 17 acres that we have here, we're talking about the whole P83 district and the city of Peoria. Um, what I'm gonna share with you next is some very not exciting slides because they're sketches that I did at the very beginning of this project um, to get started. Um, but I think they help tell the story of how we approach the project and what we find important. So what we did at the very beginning of the project, we downloaded the Google map of the P83 district. And what I did is I just took a marker and I just color coded um, what the uses are in the P83 district. And uh, in this uh, diagram basically, the yellow is retail, the pink is office, and the red is hospitality. And then you've got the sports complex in the middle. And so you can see that you guys already have a very healthy mixed use neighborhood to start out right now. Um, it's a really great start. Um, the next thing we looked at is how does it circulate? And it's basically, um, it's an auto uh, oriented kind of um, retail along two major arterials. It's kind of the straightforward way to describe it. I'm sure there's more complexities to it, but if we're just kind of look at it from really big picture, that's what we have. And then the next thing we looked at is we looked at what areas are likely to get redeveloped sometime in the future. Um, and we don't know how far in the future these things will happen at, but things like uh, you have a movie theater complex and movie theaters may not be around in the near future um, with the way things are going. You have some dated um, strip retail centers. And so we don't know when that's gonna get redeveloped, but we ought to look forward to the future of when it does, what we can do to set it up for the right kind of development pattern when it does happen. Um, and then at the heart of it, um, highlighted in green is basically the major league um, sports complex, um, which kind of is a special kind of note that makes this neighborhood um, unique. So the idea we had was, Identifying the areas that are likely to get redeveloped in the near future, figuring out a way we can create a spine, connect all those together, and then try to break the scale down to a little bit more of a pedestrian um, scale so that in the future we can create a neighborhood where people would want to go and spend time. And our idea is that 
our project would be the catalyst that sets the tone for that, basically. And it's a future vision that may take many years to get to, but it's something we need to start now um, and, um, and set the right tone, looking forward to that idea. And if we do it right, hopefully what it'll do is to seed the idea that there's gonna be other nodes that'll be created that will create that whole environment and, the, and in the future, you will have a, a P83 that is actually walkable, that actually has a sense of place, that will be something special that would be the heart of Peoria in many ways. And that is our vision uh, moving ahead. Uh, so that was the first point, is that this needs to be a catalyst for change. And the 17 acres may sound like a really large project, but really for this project to be successful, we feel like it really needs to invigorate the whole environment that's around it. And for successful doing that, it will float all boats and this will be even more successful as we move ahead. Uh, the second point, and my phone went dead <laughs> while I was talking. And give me just one second here. The second point that we wanna talk about and to get to some of our more exciting images is that we really need to create an authentic sense of, sense of place, okay? And what we're not going to do is we're not gonna take some other successful project that we did somewhere else and plop it down in Peoria. What we need to do is we need to find something that's unique to Peoria, because that's why people come to this, is if it's authentic and it's the one experience that you can get in Peoria. I will be the first to admit, we have not done that yet with our renderings and everything else, because we have not spent the time to get to know Peoria because we only had a few weeks to put this together. But that's one of the promises that we were gonna make to you is that we're gonna spend the time to get to know Peoria and figure out what makes it special. And then we're gonna put that layer of Peoria on this because we think that making this place authentic is really critical. Um, so what we're proposing is basically a mixed use complex in this 17 acres. And one of the key things for this in this area that you see for this is that the center at the heart of it is creating a public realm. This is not a private project and everything else. This is a place where people can come and spend time and make memories, basically. That's what we want to have happen. Um, one of the things that we spent a lot of time thinking about for that is how do we make this into this public realm? And we looked at the, the different types of transportation and how circulation works. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the automobiles to the outside of the project um, and create a pedestrian zone in the middle of the project where it's walkable. Um, and so to that effect, you can see in this analysis, basically we're keeping the arterials on the outside of the project. We're actually creating uh, nodes for multimodal access on the outside because we think transportation is gonna change this. And we're also trying to look at and analyze how traffic is moving to and from the stadium and make sure that when we do have events that the pieces and parts that we put in can still function while there's an event going on. Um, one of the reasons why we're proposing so many different uses is that we want this to be a 24-hour um, complex. There's people going to be living here, there's, there's hotels. We want it so that there's always eyes on the street so this becomes a safe place and it's always occupied. Um, in this rendering, this is kind of a bird's eye, but you can see uh, the hotel and that we might even have a, like a bar at the top of the hotel that could see into the stadium. So there's eyes looking out everywhere. And there's different scales on the different streets um, in order to create um, intimacy at some levels and then broader kind of venues where you could have and stage different types of events um, in, in, in the kind of the heart of the center. That's another one of the things that as we move ahead with this project, um, we would try to identify what kind of opportunities there are to partnership with the city in order to make spaces that we can be used in different ways. Um, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but you know, this project has a lot of different scales to it. Um, the main kind of commons area is quite large scale, but we are doing a lot of side streets and we're very, can be very critical about how we interface with each one of the different compartments of the, uh, the neighborhood. Um, in this rendering that you're looking at right now, this is one of the side streets where the scale gets down a little bit lower, but we're also thinking about doing things like doing live work units that come down to the street that face the stadium so that each one of the borders actually has a different character that faces, that's appropriate to whatever it faces. And then, of course, the main, another goal, this is the view from the 101, basically. And we, on purpose, put some height into this project because we want this to be a beacon um, and to be something that people can see so that it has a regional draw versus just being something that's local. And then um, the common space, we 
this is really the heart of the project. And um, it can't be said enough times that we are gonna do something with the programming that's gonna make this special. We've shown a lot of things to show activity right now, but one of the things as we move ahead is that we wanted to find something unique um, to occupy this space that will draw people. And again, this is where we see people coming and spending time. And if I haven't made this clear enough in this presentation, we are really trying to do something different than what P83 is right now. We're trying to create something that's pedestrian oriented where people will come not because it's a destination to run an errand, but come to explore and create new memories and explore. And I think that's what is kind of missing in order to create more regional draw. Um, and this final slide has all the different types of uses labeled and I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, but it kind of goes to my last point, um, is that this project has to maintain flexibility. We have very carefully, um, in slides that we're not showing to you tonight, um, talked about how we're gonna phase this project. And it's a very large project, and what we've done is broken it down into pieces, and this is probably gonna take many years to complete. We expect course corrections to happen, things like pandemics to happen, things that will happen that we can't expect that might change um, what we expect and how we build things. But I can tell you that from working with 28 years with um, Greg, that Greg's actually very good at building in a little bit of extra insurance to make sure that the buildings work um, for when we get to the time that we need to. Um, in Seattle, we did this one project. Um, it was one of our first large projects and Greg came to me and said, hey, I'm not really sure what the future for this is. Most people were building just kind of straight office. Mm -hmm. And we actually engineered a building with a little bit larger heights, a little bit more load-bearing uh, floors, uh, a little bit extra um, redundancy for the power systems. Um, and we actually put in an extra freight elevator. And then at the time, I was asking him, well, what, why are we doing all this? Because we could just get an office tenant. And Greg said, well, we don't know that for sure. What we ended up doing in that building is we ended up putting in a data center. We ended up doing a research and development um, team. We ended up filling it with so many things because Greg went the extra little bit of developing a building that was flexible enough to accommodate changing uses. In this project, we expect to do the same thing. Um, as Greg kind of alluded to earlier, this project is really dominated by parking because of the situation with the stadium um, that we're at. But in the future, we can see that there might not be as much of a need for parking at some day if autonomous parking um, starts to become a little bit of a more of a thing. Uh, so what we're probably gonna do on this project is we're gonna develop all the parking garages so they can be reconfigured into other uses. So we are not gonna do the sloped parking garages. We're gonna try to do them as flat pates. We're probably gonna do them a little bit of extra height and we'll probably do them so that, um, engineer them a little bit higher so they can take the loads for other uses so that we're looking toward the future and saying, hey, if things change, these buildings will be resilient and we'll be able to reuse them. That is probably the thing that we can do that's the most sustainable for the future is build buildings that last so we don't have to take them down and build them again. Um, those are the main points for the project um, moving ahead. I'm sure there's a thousand questions that we can answer, um, but we are really excited to do this project and partner with the city. Um, the staff has been incredible and we're really looking forward to working together with you. And we'll open up to questions. Actually, I have a couple more slides. Just oh, want to talk sure. about that, but I don't I'll know. Pass that back so. to you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, real quickly, just uh, so tonight, what we're asking council to do is to actually approve a memorandum of understanding um, with American Life. Uh, the purpose of our MOU is to set kind of the, the go forward direction and the general understanding that we have um, to form the basic terms and arrangements that we're going to have for a development agreement, which would be, if you remember on Rick's slide, is kind of the next step is to create a development agreement with, with American Life. So I want to just talk a little bit about some of the key provisions that we have uh, in the MOU. Uh, first is on land conveyance. Obviously, this is a city-owned site, so land uh, conveyance will probably be a, a pretty uh, key term as part of this uh, the, the uh, development agreement, which would include potentially negotiated purchases or long-term leases um, or a combination of purchase and lease, and then also provide some options for purchase and lease of individual pads or subdivided parcels. Uh, we would include, uh, the city will bring the site. One of the provisions is that the city is going to bring the site to construction ready condition. 
That does include moving a existing well site that is on the property. Many of you probably have seen that there. Um, it stipulates that the city and the developer will prepare a master plan or a master development plan that addresses the project phasing, which I'll show in just a moment, and some of the infrastructure requirements that are going to be required as part of that. It considers a future collaboration on other city properties, as, as um, Arthur kind of showed. There's multiple nodes that are of interest in the P83 district area. Um, so it does, it will consider a uh, potential future collaboration on that if certain timelines and benchmarks are met on the existing project. And the MOU establishes timelines for the completion and approval of the site plan and associated construction documents, as well as the overall project phases and the full completion of the project. So all of those are identified in the MOU that we're asking council to consider this evening. Um, on this slide, just to kind of discuss the, the phasing, uh, we are looking at about a four-phased project. Um, it's the contemplated phasing at this point and the associated asset classes that would go with that. As you can see, um, in phase one, we want to be able to get the site ready for construction. Let's get everything done that we need to get done to start that first um, Class A office space, retail dining, parking structure, and really get that, that first phase started. What's unique about this is that the intent is to be able to design this in a way that if at any point in any of the phases uh, there is a, a, a gap that occurs because we're not assuming any gap, but if one occurred, that we want each phase to stand on its own um, and be an important phase in the event that, um, you know, for some reason we can't move to the second phase or milestones aren't met or something. So, so the agreement would contemplate off-ramps if we needed them, but also um, the phasing that we have in here, we anticipate about an 84-month completion, which is seven years. So sometimes that's hard to hear, but projects of this size and this type um, are going to take time, and these phasings, um, every 24 months or so, getting phases going. Doesn't mean we can't overlap some phases. Sounds like Greg likes to move things along, but, um, but we're, we're contemplating about a seven-year uh, for full project completion. So you can see... Phase three would include the hotel, vertical multifamily, retail dining and entertainment, and phase four would finish off a second class A building with a parking structure, finish off the multifamily, and again, the retail dining and entertainment. And to um, Arthur's point earlier, obviously, some, uh, you know, there may be some flexibility in there depending upon what, um, what is going on at the time, but this is, but we are clear on what phase, the first phase of development will include class A office, um, and the parking structure, so that we need to make sure that that's included. And that's part of the MOU as a specific term. So with that, I'm happy um, if you have any questions for uh, Greg or Arthur, or if you have any questions of Rick and I, we're happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Any questions? Councilmember Patena? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Steinauer, thank you for being here today, and Arthur, you as well. Um, I have a question. Um, this, uh, this project has been on uh, this council's front burner for quite a while. And uh, we have had, I believe, two previous developers come in, uh, but they were unable to move this project forward. What will you do differently, and what gives you confidence that you will be able to move this project forward? Excellent question. And my short answer is because we've done it before. Um, we, every project that we've done, major project with Arthur, uh, they were just empty parking lots. least 200,000 square feet. Before we were done, we spec the building, and now it's a uh, iconic part of the city. And then down in LA, when we built a, uh, down at LA Live, right there in the heart of the city, we started a 400 room hotel. We were the first train up post recession, uh, the last recession, <laughs> not the depression. Um, and uh, we, we had a very successful project there. So we've seen it. And I, I just, I think we have a formula, all things considered, 
that if, if you create the right product, you bring the right team together, including the city, and, and you're, you want to be the best at whatever you're doing, that you'll succeed. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Great presentation. Um, as Councilman Patena said, you know, we've all been waiting a long time for something like this to, to come to Peoria, and I think this could be it. I, I'm hoping that it is it. Um, I, had a, I had a couple questions, not necessarily for you, but maybe for Katie. So what are we doing? Um, you know, we have all of our trail systems. Are we going to be working on our trails along the, the river there to connect this project to the river system? Because as we're talking about livability and wanting to get people to get out and experience this, situ this uh, environment, we need to uh, uh, make sure that we're tapping into our trails so that the residents on the other side of the river can come visit this and the business owners and the occupants of these businesses can take full advantage of the amenities that we have to offer. How are we gonna do that? So, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member Edwards, um, that's a great question as well. And actually one of the items that really um, intrigued us with American Life as they did their presentation is they didn't leave that part out. Um, they actually considered the trail system, they considered all the pedestrian ways in which people might enter into the P83 district and how they, were, how they see on a long-term vision how they might see those, those interactions occur. Um, we do, we, I, I agree with you, we have a, a wonderful amenity along uh, Skunk Creek uh, and on the north edge of Skunk Creek that's more adjacent to the, to the stadium, we might have some opportunities there and some other nodes within there to create um, a very uh, inviting and other development that's occurring along that uh, that can help in create an inviting uh, entryway into the P83 district. Uh, we've been working with ASU on a project with, about Skunk Creek to try to look at what are those opportunities, what might that look like, how do we, how do we engage the residents that are on the south side of Skunk Creek into uh, P83 without requiring them to go to 83rd Avenue or 75th potentially, or if they do, that they have an entryway in maybe from the, the back side of the stadium. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. We don't have specific projects outlined right now. Um, but as we see and as we talk more with Arthur and, and um, with Greg about the vision of this project, you know, I think we're going to gain some insights as to how we can make some of those connections, how those are going to work, and then what types, of, uh, what types of interest do we have in trying to create some of those uh, as new development comes into the area and as well as with this development, planning for that at least for the future. Thank you. I really liked your comment about, you know, getting to know Peoria better. I hope that you do get to know Peoria because we have some phenomenal people mm -hmm. in this city and I, I hope you can talk to as many of them as you can to find out exactly what makes us so special because we all know what it is, but <laughs> we want you to know as well. And then I really liked your, your comment about the um, modes of transportation as, you know, as the ways are, are changing, you know, cars, mm -hmm. autonomous cars are coming into play um, and making it walkable. I really like your comments about that and I hope that somewhere down the line if, if, we, if you guys recognize it, Tra or the, the parking structures are not needed. What are the other uh, modes of transportation that are gonna get people to and from that location? So I'm really interested to see how, how you guys are gonna work on that. So, thank if, you, Mayor. If I may just make one more comment, because I think this is really important. Because we develop around the West Coast, and you, you live in this city, your whole focus is this city, but if you step back a minute and look uh, more globally at the Peoria as a city. Earlier today, or tonight, we saw uh, approximately 5,000 5, houses are gonna be built, right? And just ballpark, they're all under $500,000, okay? On the west, major West Coast cities, Seattle, San Francisco, Southern California, you can't touch a brand new house with, uh, for $500,000. You have, Peoria has a fabulous school system and uh, lots of amenities. So you have this whole population, and especially after COVID, this is one of the things we're going to see. We're going to, and, and working remotely, why the heck are we going to be spending our entire paycheck on our house? We can come here, we can have a great quality of life, and this is going to be a tremendous attraction to employers. I'm very confident in that, even more so now than before. The reason they're not here is because there's nothing nothing's been offered to them. But when they see this, they're gonna jump on it. I'm, I'm so confident in that, so. 
And we have your rooftop bar, Mayor. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. Yes. <laughs> Councilmember Hunt. Well, thank you for that wonderful presentation, and thank you for the vision that you have. Uh, for Peoria and also your insight into understanding what a special place this is. Did I understand you're moving here? Correct. Wonderful. Uh, you will get to know us then and I I think it's the happiest place on earth. I really do. We, we have a lot of everything and, and you're going to bring just the element that we've waited for and this has been a long time coming and I want to say thank you to Rick and to Katie and uh, Jen and uh, Scott back there. I know many of you have worked on this over the years and I think we've got a winner here. I just am really excited about, like I said, your vision and, and also uh, your past history, your ability to perform. So welcome. If there's anything else we can do for you, I'm sure we'll be willing to do it. Thank you very Thank much. You. And, and we're here with open ears, right? We've, we've worked with your team. They've had a lot of input to this, and uh, we just want to make it collectively the best project that we can in, in all of Maricopa County. That's, that's really our goal. So. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, welcome to Peoria. I don't, I don't think you will regret this decision. Um, finding the right partner for this area, for this development is, is long overdue. And I, I concur with uh, the thoughts um, that the other council members have expressed. You had mentioned, you know, not about why they haven't come. I think a big reason why they haven't come is, um, you know, we just haven't had the right development in place, but class A office space is absolutely key uh, for what we want to build for our city moving forward. That is going to be key. So I love that that is in the first phase of this project. I think that's really important. Uh, I also really appreciate the fact that you're talking about a long-term sustainable project that we can grow into and the potential of what can happen with these structures in the surrounding area. And that's um, just a very realistic approach to this. I can't stress enough how eyes and ears will be on us, all of us, as we move forward with this because of what we've been through in the past. So mm -hmm. I am really excited about everything that you're sharing here and look forward to more conversation and lots of questions and all of that. A quick question for you, uh, Katie. So today we're looking at the MOU. Um, will the development agreement come before us? In, uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, any development agreement would have to come Just before the council for approval, and we are um, targeting um, sometime before the end of the calendar year to have a development agreement in place. Still have some work to do, lots of infrastructure associated with this project, yeah. clearly lots of um, assets and, and some complexity that we need to work through, but um, we do plan to have a development agreement before this council before the end of the year. Great. Thank you. If I can add, uh, council, Mayor and Council Member, uh, that doesn't mean we're waiting to have the development agreement to move forward. So we're already working on pitch decks to do co-marketing. Co um, the Class A office space, as you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, in the last 18 months uh, through GPAC, we've had 941,000 square feet requested. And in this time, people are saying, well, hey, is that slowed down? In the last three weeks, we've had 250,000 and 170,000. So the demand continues. Uh, the most commercial real estate um, professionals are thinking that it's going to continue to go. Not all of them, but we feel that way. We also think, uh, to Greg's point, is you have a lower cost of uh, li uh, living here, a low cost of doing business. You have lower regulation. And it's also a geographic hedge strategy for a lot of these corporations that have all been in one spot. And so the ability to diversify outside of their markets um, is, is a becoming more and more attractive. So we're doing a lot of our co-marketing materials along those lines. So. And one other simple fact is the Phoenix area, as you all know, is the fastest growing area in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, once you have that momentum, it's really hard to stop it. And uh, momentum creates momentum. And so that's just another uh, thing to be excited about. Thank you, and there are many, many things to be excited about tonight. I have to say that, you know, when we first met, um, I don't know how many months ago now it was when we met at the sports complex, I really felt like there was a connection. I really felt like you had um, 
an understanding of who we are or let me put it this way, I felt like there was a definite compatibility in who we are and who you are. And so I'm very, very pleased that tonight has finally come to fruition. And I know I have to wait longer in 24 month increments, but I'm not very patient. So I hope those can go Neither faster than the past has been. Um, I, was, I was really pleased to see your uh, proposal, your response, and you clearly had uh, our vision in your mind when you were um, creating this, what I call a very urban design in the city of Peoria. For a long time, we have known of all of the assets of the city of Peoria, but it has been really our little secret. Uh, not very many other people can can see it. They, they just didn't have the foresight to understand that we have the workforce and we have the needs and um, that we have the environment and the desire to change the bedroom community portion of our city into a place where our residents can really stay all day long and work and still get to their kids' games, um, you know, at a good, at a decent hour in the evening and not have to spend all of their time on the freeway. Uh, that's what our residents want. They want to transform our city into a place where they can get all of their needs met here. And you are creating an environment that is going to be exactly that for our 180,000 residents that we currently have, let alone all of the rest um, from the home builders that are, that are expected to come, and that is just a few of them. Because as you know, uh, we have only built out half of our city. And so not only are we um, going to be a magnet for the region and the Southwest, uh, we, are, we are going to be just a huge, huge asset for the citizens of Peoria who want to have a richer, fuller life. This will develop that for them. So it is more than buildings and it is more than just amenities uh, in the middle. It really is going to change how people live and feel in the city of Peoria. So for that, we are very thankful and we're very grateful that you're the ones who are here. And I meant to say hello to your wife too as we were, <laughs> as we were speaking. It was, um, it's wonderful to see you both here and, it's, and, and Arthur too. It's very glad, I'm very glad to be able to get to know all of you and know that you care deeply for the outcome and your impact in Peoria. Thank you. So we thank you and we look forward to a um, development agreement very quickly. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. And with that, I think we ought to take a vote. Do we have a motion on this MOU? We have a motion second. and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get to work. There we go. <laughs> All right, we are moving past 37 and on to 38. This is Peoria Place, planned area development amendment near Grand Avenue and Cotton Crossing. Mr. Kine. Great, thank you. And Chris Hawkins, our planning development director, will present an ordinance for your consideration uh, to approve an amendment for the Peoria Place planned area development zoning entitlement. Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. Wow, what, a, what an exciting presentation that was. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're going to talk about another uh, public-private partnership here in the city. So in a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Scott White. Um, he'll talk about the origination of this case. He is, of course, from City of Peoria's Real Estate Development Office. And so um, this was a very strategically positioned parcel. It's about 125 acres. It's near Old Town. Of course, with the entry of the MIHS facility, it's changed the whole complexion of this area. So very strategically positioned parcel. Uh, Scott's office, they approached the landowner, Highland Capital, and the representative. And over the last year, working with uh, city departments, we've collaborated on trying to reposition this um, older uh, zoning entitlement into something that responds to today's market and will provide some, we hope, some synergy with, with Old Town and, and what's going on in the area. So with that, I'm going to turn it briefly over to Scott White. Great. Thank you, Chris and Mayor, City Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before you tonight. Um, the, Pure, the Peoria Place PAD amendment is a, is a great example of four themes that I'll touch on. Uh, one is partnership, uh, two is collaboration, three is the activation of a key parcel in the city, 
uh, and, and doing that through a strategic approach. Uh, so in terms of partnership, um, I'd like to recognize and, and thank our external partners. Uh, external project partners uh, include representatives uh, representing or on behalf of the property owner, Highland Capital. That includes Matt McGrainer, uh, who is a managing director of Next Point Real Estate Advisors, who's joining us tonight. Cody Morton, uh, also of Next Point Real Estate, is an advisor. Uh, DC Souter, uh, which is general counsel uh, to Next Point Real Estate Advisors. Um, their partnership and willingness to uh, help move this key property forward has been, has been wonderful, and so we're very thankful for your help in this. Um, in terms of the landowner's representative, um, on behalf of land advisors, uh, Mike Schwab, uh, who's also with us tonight. Uh, he's a principal and designated broker with land advisor um, and has been a wonderful partner uh, in, in helping move this through the process. Um, and of course, our, our anchor tenant for the property, uh, Valley Wise Health, formerly MIHS, uh, Warren Whitney, uh, is with us tonight, uh, Senior Vice President of Governmental Relations. Uh, those are our external project partners. We also have some internal project partners that I'd really like to recognize, and that is our planning department. Um, Real Estate Development Office worked very closely and well with the planning department, very appreciative of all their help uh, and guidance uh, as we went through this process. The engineering department, both on the site development side and the traffic engineering side, uh, thank you very much for your help in that. Uh, Public Works Department on transit planning uh, was, was very helpful in our city attorney's office. Um, we also had other partners, our surrounding community, um, with our community meetings and making sure we were sensitive to their issues going forward. And of course, the Peoria Unified School District in terms of understanding what their needs are and concerns might be relative to this changing entitlement. So that's, that's our, our partnership package. Uh, in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, we also have uh, this whole effort toward putting a long idled property into productive economic use. Um, and so I'll just touch on two key things that I'm sure Chris will elaborate on. Uh, the redistribution of land uses within the existing entitlement was very important. Uh, the existing entitlement has about 80% of the entitlement in uh, multifamily housing. Uh, we felt that this property could definitely support employment generating uses, um, such as medical office, such as commercial, such as retail and industrial. Um, so the redistribution of land use was, was very important, uh, as well as updating the development standards and the circulation um, so that we could meet the high quality standards and the goals of development uh, set by the city council. Chris, as, as the prior slide might suggest, uh, we also have in the real estate development office a, a full team. Um, Decker Parrish Sabatini is a full service planning firm, Kimley Horn is a full service civil engineering firm, so we can originate various documents uh, and, and help towards activating uh, the, these properties, uh, the strategic properties throughout the city. So as the next slide will show, uh, there was quite the work plan for us to get going on, to, to get to tonight. Um, you know, negotiating with the property owner to move towards development, uh, as we know it's been long idled, um, but happy to say uh, after a three-year journey, we're, we're, we're now moving forward uh, with, a, with a positive development. Creating a development program for the site was, was really the first thing, and that started in 2017. You know, attracting the anchor tenant, now Valleywise, then MIHS, was hugely important for the site. Um, confirming all the industrial and commercial office market data, you know, creating conceptual land use plans, and negotiating land use plans and land, land use matrices, uh, initiating the PAD amendment, you know, creating density models and site plans, and finally submitting the draft, the community meeting, resubmitting, and now finally planning commission earlier this, this uh, month and now before you tonight. So it's been a long journey, um, but I think we're finally almost there. Um, and so I just wanna thank our partners uh, for the collaboration and uh, look forward to new development coming to Southern Peoria. So with that, let me turn it back over to Chris, uh, who will talk about the planning side. Great, well thank you, Scott. That was a, that was a great introduction. So now what we'll do is just take a, a little closer look at the property and the proposed entitlement. Again, this is an amendment to the existing PAD zoning for Peoria Place that's been in place since 2006. 
Uh, the site's identified in yellow on the screen, um, 125 acres in size. Uh, contextually, uh, to the uh, Grand Avenue is the northern uh, boundary of it. North of Grand Avenue, of course, is the Super Walmart. There are some outlying neighborhoods and then Santa Fe Elementary School. Uh, to the south of the site is, um, well, it says Madison Estates, but I believe it's signed as Pinecrest. I believe that's a neighborhood. And then Roundtree Ranch is also to the south of it. Um, along the um, southern and eastern portion along Grand Avenue, um, there are some light industrial manufacturing or warehouse uses. And then west of the site, of course, is the Peoria City Hall. That triangular parcel, I'll talk about that in a minute, but that is uh, west of Cotton Crossing, uh, directly adjacent to the Old Town area. The major access points, of course, into Peoria Place, uh, as you know, Grand Avenue, um, 83rd Avenue and Cotton Crossing. Whitney Drive is a, is a collector that um, uh, transects the site and turns into 79th. 79th and Olive is a currently signalized intersection. Okay, as Scott indicated, the purpose of this entitlement was, um, again, the, the current entitlement I'll talk about in a minute just for um, reflection, but it was done in uh, 2006. The entry of Valleywise really changed the complexion of this area. Um, and so the purpose of this was to um, completely restructure the entitlement for today um, and try to provide some synergy with uh, around Valleywise and also our Old Town area. So this is a brand new PUD, PAD that you'll see that um, completely repositioned some of those land uses. Scott mentioned that the prior PAD was about 82% of the land area was residential. Now it's about 43%. Um, additionally, the, the development standards have been adjusted to respond to the new land uses. Um, there are now the entry of design guidelines, and some of these design guidelines go a little bit beyond our current design guidelines, and they try to really um, um, reinforce the importance of placemaking and having um, good connectivity between these parcels as well. And also, I think another um, important item that you'll see on the plan is that uh, Whitney Drive, there is a proposal to um, redirect that uh, through the triangular parcel into Old Town to not only improve pedestrian and transit access in the future, but provide a front door for the Old Town area. Right now, it's a little circuitous from 83rd Avenue around the traffic circle, and we're hoping that uh, a more direct route provides that uh, better synergy between both sides. Okay, so just uh, as a basis of reflection, this is the current PAD that was done in 2006 with Wright Path Limited. Uh, again, this is predominantly residential. If you focus on that triangular parcel that's in purple, that was uh, designated for office uses there. Um, parcels two and three, which are the ones in orange, um, that was a combination of medium density residential and low density residential. Parcel four, that yellow strip, that was adjacent to Roundtree Ranch. So that was basically a edge condition that, that replicated what Roundtree Ranch density was. Parcels five, six, and seven is where you'll see the major changes that I'll show tonight. Those parcels at that time were designated for high density residential, for, for multi-family type of development. And then the, uh, what is that, maroon? I guess it's maroon in parcel eight. Um, that was designated as uh, town center mixed use. So the town center mixed use parcel along with the office, um, the, the, the site plans and the development standards that were indicated in this entitlement really um, kind of turned its back on Old Town. They, they really um, fronted and faced, uh, embraced Cotton Crossing. So it was very two disparate developments. And I think what you'll see with the new plan is a very different, uh, different result. All right, so on to the new. Um, parcels one and two, that's, in, that's the triangular area in pink there. That's what we're calling the Old Town Mixed Use. It's about eight acres. You can see, of course, the proposed Whitney Drive um, bisection of that area. Um, this is what we see as a continuation of Old Town. So not only the scale, the heights of buildings, but also the form. When I talk about development form, we're talking about buildings that embrace the street, that have little setbacks, that uh, really are a continuation of what you see in Old Town and the uses that you would expect in Old Town. Parcels three through five. Now, parcel three is in brown. That's what we're calling medium high density, 10 to 20 units per acre. So it can, it can uh, and, and what's envisioned is a whole range of product types, anything from uh, um, horizontal single family to your traditional multifamily development that could occur on that parcel. As you go to the south and you get to the orange or parcel four, that's more of a medium density residential. What's envisioned there is more of a uh, detached single family like you might expect at Pinecrest uh, to the west, uh, possibly duplexes or townhomes. And then that yellow strip parcel five, that again is a really a, a continuing replication of what you see at Roundtree Ranch with detached single family. 
Okay, with, um, if we cross over to 79th on the east side, parcel six, which is the aqua, aqua area, that's envisioned as business park. This is the area that, uh, that is adjacent to those light industrial areas to the south and east and along Grand Avenue. This is envisioned more for um, office and business park, light manufacturing, um, with some support of retail and commercial services that would, that would uh, support those areas. Um, it's about 26 acres in size, and so one of the stipulations here is that it, we want it to be a, a, a true business park, and so there is a maximum of five acres that could be used for storage uses, but it's mostly, mostly uh, planned and, and programmed for um, you know, business park and office uses. Parcel seven is the, uh, the blue in the middle. Um, that is the commercial retail parcel that's directly adjacent to the Valleywise facility. We see office, restaurants, special retail. We understand that it's along a highway like Grand Avenue, but we want it to have um, really more of a, a reflection and uh, position based on placemaking. So while there is some ability to have some drive through there is a limitation on drive throughs there because we want it to be uh, commercial offices and, and, and retail that support walking, that support uh, you know, the, uh, the activity that's going to be adjacent to the Valley Wise facility. And then, of course, parcel eight, which is the current uh, facility that you see with a striped uh, pattern there. That's the, that's the Valley Wise facility parcel. This slide shows the circulation and pedestrian plan. I talked earlier about multiple points of access. Um, many of these points of access were, uh, were developed early on with the original entitlement. Of course, that entitlement hit the recession of 2007 and 8 and, and didn't move forward. Uh, this uh, proposal, as I mentioned, um, has Whitney Drive, um, proposes a realignment to Old Town, and so that's what you see that by section through parcels one and two. Um, there's also along um, Whitney Drive, which is the collector that goes to the middle of the parcel, there's also access, to, future access to Grand Avenue. Um, that's called Purdue Avenue. That's going to be the future street of Purdue. The access there would be limited. Uh, the ADOT controls Grand Avenue, and they have a limited access plan. Right now, it would be right in, right out access. Um, any uh, uh, further access beyond that is dependent upon the use and a traffic study that uh, provides the warrants for ADOT and the city to approve greater access beyond what it is today. So that's a, that's a future conversation based on, on the land use and the product that we see out there. Um, also with uh, this uh, plan also envisions multiple um, circulation and pedestrian access points, not only between parcels, but also throughout the development um, and through adjoining outlying areas. As you've uh, come to know and expect, every uh, rezone has a public outreach process. We provide a notice of application at the beginning of the project and we provide a notice of hearing prior to its uh, going to planning commission and council. With this size of a project, we hit one quarter mile. That's the radius that we provide the, the, uh, the mailings to and all registered HOAs within a one mile area. We uh, had a neighborhood meeting on uh, September 25th. Uh, we had 19 property owners and tenants. We had a very good attendance there. Uh, many from the Roundtree Ranch area. The uh, comments that we heard at that meeting, there was, uh, uh, you know, comments and questions about how is the traffic generation going to work? Is there going to be an intersection at 83rd and Mountain, uh, Mountain View? The answer is potentially. There could potentially be uh, a lighted intersection also at Whitney and uh, Cotton Cross and Well. It's all going to depend on the, uh, the traffic studies that will come as each parcel comes into fruition and the warrants that they, that they suggest. Um, there was also questions about pedestrian connections, uh, what will the, the impacts be on existing neighborhoods, and what's the process and timing for this whole development to come to fruition. So through the life of this project, we have not uh, got any, um, uh, any stated uh, you know, op points of opposition. We did get one email that was of somebody was requesting additional information on the case, so we answered those questions. We've also got an email from the uh, Peoria Unified School District, and they have uh, verified that there is capacity within their school district, and they understand that as additional parcels come in, that we will we will be uh, um, working with the developer in the school district on uh, understanding their product type, their student generation, and um, additional uh, questions beyond that. This item went to the Planning and Zoning Commission on June 4th. Um, there were no members of the public present at that case. Uh, the commission uh, was very supportive of the project. They voted unanimously to recommend approval. So um, in summary, the, the findings that we have is that this proposal is it's in conformance not only with the general plan, but the Old Town specific area plan. We think it's definitely an improvement to the existing entitlement that it's in place. 
the development standards and the land use distributions are, are appropriate and responsive to uh, the, the new reality out there. The circulation plan creates a better gateway into Old Town, and so we'll have uh, just another point of entry into Old Town. And we believe the uh, conditions will, uh, um, and the necessary infrastructure will be constructed to maintain the network within this part of Peoria. So, Mayor and Council, with that, uh, our recommendation is that you approve the ordinance to um, update and approve the new entitlement. And with that, myself or Scott, I'm sure, is willing to take any questions you have. Thank you. Council, are there any questions, comments? Council Member Hunt? Well, this one, too, has been a very long time coming. And uh, I, I couldn't be happier. And to those of you back there that are <clears throat> join, joining us in this project, welcome. You're, you're very welcome. You're long overdue. So um, I, I love this project, the way it's been finessed, and it's, very, it's been very malleable. Um, I'm happy for the residents, the surrounding residents' approval and acceptance. I've had a million questions over all these years about what's going to go in there and when are the tumbleweeds going to go away. And uh, so now I think we have some answers for them. And thank you, Scott. You've been so diligent on this. You and I have held hands over this project. I don't even want to think how many years. So um, just thank you. And I love the direction this is heading. Thank, thanks to you in the back also, all of you. Anyone else? Okay, well, I have to concur. It, it is really um, a great modernization of a plan that, you know, was hit really hard by some economic conditions over and over and over again, and then a pandemic. So <laughs> who knew? But it, it stood up to all of that. And in the meantime, we were happy, very, very happy to welcome Valley Wise. And we still are happy that you are there waiting for you to open um, as we get past this yet another hurdle that we have, um, but I think that this is gonna be a, a great um, amenity. The, the changes are, are going to amenitize the area all around you, and so, and uh, as well as um, amenitizing the access into Old Town, where we hope all of your employees will go every day at lunchtime. So uh, with that, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve Ordinance 2020-09 as recommended by staff. Do you have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Scott, thank you for all of your years of work on this. <laughs> all right. And we will now move on to item 39R, West Valley Cooperative Homelessness Effort. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor. And Chris Hallett, our Neighborhood and Human Services Director, will uh, put forward a, a recommended resolution for the West Valley to address homelessness in our region. And I'll pass it to Mr. Hallett. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, uh, Mayor and Council. Very excited to be here tonight. Uh, we've been meeting organically a bunch of West Valley cities uh, for the past 18 months since I've been here. Uh, and it's, we call ourselves the West Valley Human Services Coalition. In fact, we have a meeting again tomorrow. And it primarily makes up Avondale, El Mirage, Glendale, Goodyear, Peoria, Surprise, Tolleson, and Youngtown, to name a few. And what we've experienced in our interactions and working with the county and MAG is there's some power in the numbers. And what we'd look to do is to formalize what we've been actually doing uh, organically over this time. Now, it focuses primarily on human service uh, areas of concern, but we've primarily been focused a lot on the homeless lately and in conjunction with, and we adopted some of the language here that you see on this resolution from the county and MAG. Uh, it was adopted by the East Valleys, and we've seen tremendous success since they've adopted the resolution in competing for funds at the regional level for MAG and, and others. So we want to coalesce as the West Valley cities to do the same. Uh, efforts around the homelessness plague the whole region for sure. They certainly plague our West Valley cities uh, with our borders so uh, near and dear to each one of us. Uh, and the more we work together, the better we're going to be able to handle these um, problems. Um, uh, um, 
this will complement what we're already doing, as I said. Uh, it will, it will uh, and be in alignment with each of our city's uh, consolidated plans, which we just recently adopted, as well as with the county's consortium plan. Uh, we already have commitments from several of the cities. El Mirage already adopted this resolution two weeks ago. Uh, it's on the agenda for surprise in Peoria tonight. And Glendale's committed to take it in June or, or the next available one in August. There's others that have shown commitment. They're still working through their councils. We're certain that more will fall in place as soon as uh, several of the cities adopt the resolution, and we look forward to those. There's absolutely no cost to this. All it is is opens the doors for opportunity we see from grant funding and other uh, opportunities. Uh, we do meet, as I said, monthly, and it's not just uh, these agencies from these cities, we bring our law enforcement because there's a lot. We, we collaborate across the law enforcement of each of the jurisdictions, working with the county and the human uh, homeless management information system. We work with many of the nonprofit stakeholders to bring in and collaborate. Uh, it's this group that kind of yielded the two um, cooperative agreements that you have fully adopted with the, the, home, uh, uh, the emergency homeless bed night cooperative agreement, mm -hmm. which is available to all the West Valley cities, as well as our uh, uh, homeless outreach and navigation is also a cooperative agreement. So as we do more of these, we can take advantage of each other's contracts. Uh, we hope to be able to, with this approval, continue doing what we've been doing uh, to research best practice, share data and contracts uh, in order to explore opportunities for a more balanced approach to homelessness. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Councilor, are there any questions? Uh, Homelessness is, is a really big subject, <laughs> and I can understand why you would want to collaborate with all of the cities. I mean, obviously, it doesn't stop at any of our borders, and it's more important for us to, to share the issue and find ways to um, solve it as a region. And so I completely appreciate that, um, and I appreciate the work that you and your team have done. Um, I know Benny Pena is in our audience here, and he has done a lot of work um, with our Peoria Police Department, and hopefully some of that can be shared. If, if it already hasn't been, I know he's pretty collaborative already. Um, but they, we have a lot of assets, and we're happy and able to share them. And so I appreciate you working on this, this issue as it continues to grow. And hopefully we can find ways to solve problems that um, seem quite large sometimes. So thanks very much for your efforts on this. And with that, um, I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to circle back around to something that we um, slid to a different portion of our agenda at the very beginning, and this is a presentation on our Youth Council Liaison Service Awards. Um, and so I am going to just make a, a few remarks here, if I might, uh, to talk about our Youth Council Liaison Program. Every year, the City of Peoria uh, City Council provides youth with the opportunity to serve as non-voting members at City Council meetings. This is known as the Youth Council Liaison Program, and it is designed to provide Peoria youth a positive civic experience on the art of governance the art of governance, I love that term, and an opportunity to share different perspectives. This year, uh, Ritika Ravindran and Brighton Greathouse served as the two Youth Council liaisons and were sworn in on August 13th, 2019. Over the past nine months, Ms. Greathouse and Ms. Ravindran have actively participated in city council meetings, attended numerous community events, and have shared a youth perspective on issues of the day. Their leadership and insight have been invaluable, and they have made Peoria proud. We mean that. Uh, at your seat is a plaque thanking you for your service and dedication to our city. Is there anyone else from our city council who would care to make some remarks um, as we say farewell to our two youth council liaisons this season? Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. You, you covered it beautifully, but I just want to thank you both for participating and representing the youth, and you've done so so well with such professionalism, and though everything kind of came to a screeching halt, 
um, we won't forget your impact and your presence here. And keep up the great work and continuing to lead and set an example for other youth. Uh, it's so important. The work you're doing is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Dunn? I just wanted to thank you both also. You guys really showed a tremendous amount of leadership in, in some of the issues that you tackled and in, in working with the other youth. So it's, I just wanted to let you know that I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Councilmember Edwards? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would concur. Uh, you young ladies are phenomenal, and I know we're going to see great things coming out of you, you know, through you, and whatever you choose to do. I mean, just your your endeavor that you're working on mental health issues with youth in Peoria and with the West Valley. You guys took a leadership in that, and I just really commend you. Um, and getting into all the schools and working on not a very easy topic, but you guys handled it uh, with grace and hopefully. The next uh, youth members will continue to uh, work on that on that goal. So, good luck in your future. And if there's anything we can do, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. If there's anything we can do in the future, we are here for you, and we thank you for being here for us for all this time. And congratulations. All right, we are now going to move on to. Call to the public for non-agenda items. I have not received any speaker request forms, so we will move on to reports from the city manager. Mr. Time. Great, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council. This was a, a very substantial agenda that we had tonight, and uh, it took a lot of time and brain power to go through, but uh, it was so important to us. Uh, you know, a couple of reasons, obviously, for that. Obviously, the Recent conditions had us focus on many other items, but also we have a little longer break between council meetings. So uh, very much appreciate this, but we're excited to see so much of our future uh, being discussed tonight. That's, that's kind of refreshing to be able to mm -hmm. talk about that rather than just the here and now uh, as we go through. Wanted to give a, a little bit of a here and now conversation about um, our COVID-19 update and just provide you a little bit of detail. So as we continue to adjust to the new normal that we call 2020, it's important to remember that as a city, we still remain in phase one of our recovery efforts. And as we watch key statistics that are showing that COVID activity mm -hmm. is continuing in Maricopa County, we want to remain flexible and vigilant as we run our daily affairs. So while a number of Peoria facilities are indeed open and a host of our programs are running, we will need to watch those act and the activity within there very closely. Uh, I would like to congratulate our staff continually to adapt to these changing conditions. It's been an amazing uh, t time for all of us, but I've just been so impressed and proud of our staff as they've worked through this. One great example of that is the planned July 4th event that we have coming up. While we were unable to put on a large special event at the sports complex grounds, we will be offering a fireworks display in different locations, three different locations throughout the city, which we will hope will allow for residents to be, uh, view these fireworks from their homes and common areas in all of the different areas. So very neat and exciting uh, adjustment to things. Also want to uh, continue to talk about the new economic realities that we also focus as well. Fortunately, as I had discussed in our study session two weeks ago, we have been bolstered by federal financial assistance. And thank you to Governor Ducey and his allocation of the AZ CARES funding, along with revenue from the Community Development Block Grant, Federal Transit As uh, Association, other federal grants that have gone through it is going a long way to maintaining the services that are so important to our residents while not placing an additional tax or fee burden on our residents and businesses. Per your direction two weeks ago, and also approved on consent agenda tonight, uh, we did put forward a number of different investments that we will deploy CARES Act funding quickly to get back into our community. So very briefly, we have our three deputy city managers to highlight some of the key elements of our support. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it first, I believe, to Mr. Granger, and then we'll just go left, left to right for them. Sure, thank you, Mr. Tyne, uh, Mayor and Council. From a, uh, as uh, Mr. Tyne mentioned, uh, thank, thanks to the CARES Act grant, as well as the Department of Justice, which uh, uh, we were approved for a grant for $82,800 that you approved tonight. That will help us um, provide ser additional services to our citizens from both a police and a fire medical perspective. 
Um, from a fire medical perspective, uh, with the CARES Act funding, we, uh, we propose for $500,000, we'll allow for the operation of a two-person community paramedicine unit that will operate seven days a week, um, eight hours a day. It's a two-person crew uh, that will last approximately one year with that funding. So that will help us address the pandemic as well as other community uh, paramedic issues that we've got throughout the city. And then for the police department with an additional $500,000 as well as that Department of Justice grant, um, the funding will allow for additional PPE equipment and cleaning supplies for the police department, equipment for uh, the police department to work remotely instead of in their offices during the pandemic, uh, a traffic message board that will increase public awareness, especially with the pandemic and, and uh, provide mess public messages while uh, traveling throughout the city department vehicles for, this, for the police department, and then additional overtime and one-time staffing for COVID-19 quarantine re requirements and enforcement patrols. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Gregory. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, as uh, Mayor and Council, as you are aware, we've been working very closely with our small businesses, trying to assess um, and understand what their needs are um, and how we can address some of those with the additional Funding that came through with the CARES Act, we have some opportunities that uh, weren't available to us possibly even before. Uh, but we are looking at a couple of different programs that would help assist our small businesses. And again, focusing uh, some CDBG dollars towards uh, some businesses that fall into the low mod income where they either employ low mod income individuals or they themselves as a business um, are considered low moderate uh, income. Um, we'd look, like to look at uh, finding ways to get them some funding through CDBG to help um, assist their businesses deal with some of the recovery pieces that, they're, that are still uh, lingering. We're also looking at developing, um, which we've already developed and, and are getting ready to uh, put out the uh, small business loan program. This again, I think I've mentioned before, is a partnership with one of the local banks, Bell Bank. Um, and what this really does is that the city, uh, the city would, would be, the, the role the city has in this is that we would be a guarantor of the funding um, for some of these loans, meaning their personal loans, but that um, we would be looking to uh, underwrite to some degree those loans in, the, in this sense or be the guarantor of these loans so that the bank can offer low interest rates, favorable terms, and get to those some of those, those small businesses that have been still continuing to struggle to find funding. Um, so it's another avenue um, of resources. Um, we're also going to be looking to, with some CARES Act funding, and this will be uh, kind of coming out a little bit later, um, is uh, to put some of that funding towards up to a million dollars of that towards some small business grants. Now the key to this is that we'd have to work with a third party, um, not for profit, uh, that could help administer this program. That's our that's our desire is to find a third party not for profit who could administer this program on behalf of the city, um, and get those direct grants out to our uh, small businesses in the city. So that's another program we're working on. Um, la not lastly, but another item is the uh, that ca actually came out of the mayor's ad hoc uh, committee is uh, looking to see if there's ways that we can provide businesses, especially restaurants, but retail businesses as well with a, um, what I'd call a reopening and um, uh, inspection to some degree of someone who a third party could come in and say, they have met all of the CDC requirements. They are following those requirements in, in their operations with their, with their uh, businesses, and therefore they are, have been identified um, in some way, shape, or form as a uh, business that is doing that and we'd like to be able to provide those services so that we can get those inspections out there One of the things we're finding is a lot of businesses are feeling that customers are maybe hesitant to come back Concerned that maybe not all the guidelines are being followed. This would be a way for us to help them um, Meet those show that they're meeting those guidelines and that they are they are ready and and open for business And then the last one would be uh, with our small businesses is really going to be this uh, uh, local business promotion um, we're going to use some CARES Act funding to make to get out and survey um, our local businesses, assess what are those continued needs. What we saw in the beginning of the of the pandemic is different than what we're seeing now in terms of the needs of some of these businesses. They're beginning to um, get back to business, but it's not as robust clearly. So, what are some of those needs, and what are the other services that we might be able to do to boost their marketing and promotional efforts and get really get their name out there? Not all businesses um, are as uh, as uh, uh, robust in the way that they market and, and promote their business. So we want to make sure that they have the tools 
um, to do that. So we would be working with, with um, some different partners to help do that for the small businesses or at least give them some assistance in that. I'll give it to you, yes. <laughs> Mayor and Council, um, Katie talked a lot about small business support, which is vital. Um, I get the other piece of that, which is people make up and are employed by a lot of small businesses. So because of COVID and the, and the impacts, it's, it's, we know it's going to have and it already has. Uh, you know, unemployment rates are up. There may be social um, mm -hmm. concerns that pop up. We're fortunate enough to, to hopefully use a bit of this money for additional utility assistance. Uh, we're, we're requesting and we'd like to use about half a million dollars for that. We know there will be individuals that won't be able to pay the power, the gas, the water, and so on. So if we if we ramp that up, we feel very comfortable that it will be well met by our community. Rental and mortgage assistance, um, that's going to be a big item. And um, we know that individuals uh, will have difficulty probably paying their rent um, or their mortgage. So we will be working with a third-party nonprofit to administer up to a million dollars worth of mortgage and rent assistance. And it will be um, structured in a way that they qualify based on their income and where they perhaps live. And we expect that we can assist about uh, 300 or so pure residents. It's not a whole lot when you look at a monthly rent and a monthly mortgage, but it's something to start from. A couple other quick things from a social standpoint. Some are child care services and child care in general. Um, we have introduced uh, professional nursing staffs for doing wellness checks on the participants. We've had to downsize the number of individuals that participate in those. It has an added cost, so we are seeking some of the funds to use for that. We're looking at about $75,000 over the next six months. And then finally, this is, this is kind of unique. One of the things we thought we could do is, hey, in our libraries of all places, what can we do to potentially help students that may not have access to technology uh, and are receiving assignments from their schools and uh, they can't afford uh, Wi-Fi connections or may not even have um, Chromebooks, personal laptop devices. So a portion of the funds we are seeking, about $150,000. It will cover purchase price and a little bit of the operating expense initially. Um, we want to buy an additional 200 of those to offer up to Peoria students and really residents also who may be seeking employment jobs um, because of the, the, uh, the circumstances they're faced with. We really think that uh, that will be well received by the community and, and we feel very strongly it's the right thing to do at this point in time. A couple other things that we'll be doing, um, maintaining a, self, uh, a healthy uh, work environment, campus, and, and city facilities is very important to us, not only for employees, but also for customers that come here. So a good portion, about $380,000 of, of we hope to use will be for additional cleaning um, and response devices. You've heard a little bit about fogging machines that you can spray um, in vehicles. We're looking at acquiring those. There's new technology, UV lights, um, portable UV lights, that if there is an instance or instance of, uh, of COVID breaking out somewhere, we can de deploy those and use those in our city facilities. So in a nutshell, we're kind of looking at really, really strengthening um, our, our offerings to the Peoria community from a social and human service standpoint and additional PPP and E and, and, um, and uh, healthy work environments. Wow. <laughs> and that is a tremendous amount of of giving back and additional assets for our business community and for our residents. Uh, it's very impressive and I really thank you guys for all of the work that you have put forward to so carefully define how we can use this money for the greatest good and the longest term uh, effect. So thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Kathy. Yes, Council Member Hunt. Eric, I just had a quick question back to the students and getting the Chromebooks or whatever we decide to provide. What about those that don't really have access to to the Wi-Fi? To the I yep. know that's a problem here in South Peoria, especially. I don't know about the North. Yep, Mayor, um, Council Member Hunt. Um, the answer is is there's we're proposing to also purchase devices that are portable that mm -hmm. you'll be able to check out from your library our library, 
you can take those home. If you don't have um, Wi-Fi service, if you don't have access to it um, for whatever reason, you'll be able to check that out, um, attach that to your computer, and you'll have that that access to the internet and to do your assignments from. A, yeah, that's a, that's a great little contrivance. I have one of those yeah. myself. And I'm wonderful. Yeah, that, that's a very good use of that money because it doesn't do any good to have the computer if you can't get the signal. So good job, all of you. Great. That it, it sounds wonderful to be given a whole lot of money, doesn't it? But then when it's really quite a job to spend it properly. <laughs> so good job. Thank you. Thanks very much. You know, one just last comment to that is, um, you know, we, we use that term community partnership quite often. But when we think about what's happened since mid-March, where we had a council that gave us direction about we need to infuse investments early and often in the areas of for those that are most vulnerable into our business community who are most hit. And then you had stakeholders, including citizens and ad hoc committees in the business community and the higher institutions in the chamber, give us their subject matter expertise. And then you have the staff to put this forward in a short amount of time. It's something that we should all be proud of in Peoria. So mm -hmm. with that, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to make a few comments. Uh, you just heard from our city manager, Jeff Tyne, and we don't often talk about our city manager. He's kind of behind the scenes there, but he is really um, running our city. He is the CEO of our city. And last week, our city council took some time to assess the city manager's performance over the last year. And I just want to publicly commend Jeff Tyne for a job well done. Um, a lot of a lot of unusual things have occurred this year. I think everybody knows 2020 has been a, a, a different kind of year. Um, then he was on track, moving council goals forward, such as the agreement that we heard about tonight. Uh, the developer of Stadium Point was here, and that plan um, is tremendous for the future of our city. And. Um, Plans are progressing around Old Town and the revitalization of our uh, historic district down there as well as um, the Valley Wise Hospital area. So that is all moving forward. Uh, we also discussed this evening some very large milestone infrastructure projects that have to do with water. And these are all future changing projects. Uh, occurring at the same time, uh, the same time that he was already leading a financially stable um, organization of excellence. Then a global pandemic hit. And Jeff calmly and deliberately uh, moved into emergency management mode, uh, protecting service delivery for our residents while monitoring and uh, modifying employee working conditions for safety and for reliability for our citizens. And the situation continued to change very, very rapidly. The environment from day to day was something new. And he systematically shut down the city and um, while guiding public safety and making sure that we, could, we maintained financial security uh, for the city of Peoria, he offered multiple avenues, and some of which you've heard this evening, of assistance to our small business community uh, who suffered immediate and severe impacts from having to close down for, of course, health and safety reasons. Then, as it continued to evolve based on CDC guidelines, uh, he created a plan for phased reopening for our city. I even had a reporter call me and say, uh, nobody else has put forth a phased reopening plan yet. Please tell me about that. You're the first one in the Valley. So um, that was tremendous. And as of today, we, we continue to abide with caution in phase one. And he did all of this without havoc or fear of any kind, as a good leader does. Uh, Jeff, as, as you can see, sitting here at the study session table tonight, Jeff has built a strong coalition of leaders around him. And they work as an incredible team throughout the year. Uh, but their synergy was especially evident during this unprecedented time. So thanks to all of you for all of the extra, extra work that you always put in. 
And even though it was warranted during these difficult times, Jeff has chosen to forego any adjustments to his contract. And on behalf of the Peoria City Council, I just wanna say thank you for the outstanding job that you were doing before the global pandemic hit and for your strong and smart management as we continue to navigate through it. So you have our gratitude. Thank you. I just wanted to bring that up. We don't often get to talk about our city manager. Tonight we did. So with that, we are adjourned. I'd like to call this meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. Uh, we're gonna start tonight's meeting with a roll call vote. And I'll begin with Vice Chairman Jay Outluski. Present. Secretary Brian Patterson. Commissioner Sean Hutchinson. Present. Commissioner Linda Grice. Present. Commissioner Clay Alsop. Commissioner Tony Fighter, present, and chair is present. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with an opening statement that we begin all of our meetings with. Uh, this one is slightly revised, and uh, my apologies, a little bit longer than usual, but we'll try to get through this in speedy fashion. Uh, the commission is composed of Peoria citizens who have been appointed by the city council to serve on the commission as a civic responsibility without compensation. Our duty is to study and review planning and zoning issues within the city of Peoria. The commission hears zoning cases, holds public hearings, or may conduct a study session on a topic. Decisions made by the commission are forwarded as written recommendations to the city council who take the final action. As part of the city's phased approach to reopening buildings and facilities amid the COVID-19 pandemic, tonight's planning and zoning meeting will be conducted using measures to protect public health. Consequently, tonight's meeting is being held in the Peoria Council Chamber with some protocols in place, including restricted capacity within the chamber. Should we reach capacity level, members of the public will be redirected to a separate viewing room to watch the meeting remotely. Alternatively, we have uh, encouraged our members of the public to listen to the meeting remotely by viewing the meeting via the live stream broadcast at Facebook at City of Peoria AZ or YouTube at Digital Peoria. In addition to viewing online, Peoria residents may also view the meeting live on Cox Channel 11 or CenturyLink Channel 8509. Please be advised there will be no call to the public during tonight's meeting. These measures are in place to ensure the health and safety of our residents while ensuring that discussions, deliberations, and actions of the Planning and Zoning Commission remain transparent. Should members of the public have comments or questions regarding items on tonight's agenda, they may submit them via email to planning at peoriaaz.gov. Again, that's planning at peoriaaz.gov, G-O-V. Comments that were received by the planning department prior to 6 p.m. today will be read into the record during the respective agenda item. All hearings are conducted in accordance with the rules for procedures. Each case will be called in the order in which it appears on the agenda unless otherwise announced during the meeting. In the interest of maintaining a fair and efficient hearing, the commission will adhere to the following steps. Chair will open the case. City staff will then provide a brief report and recommendation. The application is then invited to give a presentation. Then the chair will read the submitted testimony provided by the public ahead of tonight's meeting. After all the testimony has been taken, we'll invite the applicant back up to provide any rebuttal or final statements. And then finally, we'll have the commission discussion and decision. Any member of the public may appeal to the city council the decision, the decision of the commission regarding a conditional use permit. 
the appeal must be submitted in writing to the Planning and Community Development Department within 15 calendar days of the Commission's decision. All Commission recommendations on public hearing items, including general plan amendments, rezones, zoning code amendments, and special plans, move forward to a regular City Council meeting. The City Council will consider the recommendation of the Commission and make the final determination. The City Council may concur with the decision, modify it, overturn it, or remand it back to the Commission for further consideration. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our opening statement. So our first agenda uh, item of business tonight is uh, the consent agenda. The consent agenda is for items that are routine in nature and consists of just one item tonight. That's item 1C, discussion and possible action to approve the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting held on April 4th, 2020. Do any commissioners have any questions or comments about any of the consent agenda items before us tonight? On the phone, any questions on the consent agenda? No. All right. Thank you. May I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move that the commission approve the minutes uh, of April 9th as presented in the package. Thank you. And thank you for that correction. You're right, that, I, that on the screen is incorrect. That is the, is the April 9th meeting. Thank you for catching that. We have a motion, and do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Uh, we're going to take a roll call vote on the motion to approve the consent agenda. So, commissioners, if you could please respond with a yes or no when I call your name. We'd appreciate that. We'll start with Commissioner Otluski. Yes. Commissioner Hutchinson? Yes. Commissioner Grice? Yes. Commissioner Fighter? Yes. And Chair votes yes. Thank you. That consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioners. We're going to move on to our regular agenda next. We have one item before us tonight for discussion and possible action, and that's item 2R, Peoria Place Planned Area Development Amendment. We'll have discussion and possible action on case Z06-03A.1. This is to amend the Peoria Place planned area development on approximately 125 acres of land located south and west of Grand Avenue and Cotton Crossing. And with that, staff, would you please present your report? Thank you. Good evening, Chairman, members of the Commission. Um, before Rick gets into presenting the staff report uh, for the case this evening, I wanted to introduce you to Scott White, who is the Real Estate uh, Development Officer for the City of Peoria. Uh, Scott and his team has been leading the City's ongoing efforts to work collaboratively with owners and City departments to help reposition properties, strategically st strategic properties within the City. And so the case before you uh, this evening is the direct result of that public-private partnership um, going forward. So right now, I'd like to turn it over to Scott to say a few words to talk more about Redo and its activities. Scott? Great. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, Planning Commissioners, for this opportunity to be before you tonight. Uh, as uh, Lori mentioned, uh, the Real Estate Development Office, or Redo, as a relatively new office uh, at the city. Uh, we've been around for maybe two and a half, three years. And uh, we were put in place for really one purpose, and that is to try and create new opportunities for commercial office, industrial, uh, retail, food and beverage uh, development opportunities in the city. Uh, as you know, we have scarcely few uh, large strategic developable parcels um, in south and central uh, Peoria. Uh, and, and so we, we look at these key parcels and working with partners, uh, and, and the key there is the public-private partnerships for strategic development. Uh, those partners can be private landowners, they can be public landowners, they can be developers. Uh, and, and what we actually do is we uh, originate the land use entitlements for our partners, uh, which is a fairly unique uh, municipal offering. You don't see that very often. Uh, we can originate uh, general plan amendments, specific area plan amendments, PAD amendments, new PADs. Uh, we acquire land. Uh, and uh, for the purpose of repositioning parcels, 
whether new greenfield development, new infill development, or redevelopment of areas in need of revitalization. Uh, so we've uh, also done visioning and design concepts for key character areas of the city. Uh, so it's all for the purpose of moving forward uh, strategic development on key parcels in the city. Um, and in fact, we're joined tonight uh, by uh, Mike Schwab of Land Advisors, who represents Highland Capital, uh, who is the property owner for Peoria Place tonight. Uh, so we thank them for their partnership in, in making this opportunity uh, possible. Um, as, as we all know, Peoria Place is a fantastic property. Uh, it's large, it has great frontage on Grand Avenue. Um, it's a key piece uh, associated with uh, the revitalization and revital, um, and, and reuse of our old town um, adjacent to the municipal complex and some wonderful communities uh, adjacent. Um, it, it has existing zoning um, that is predominantly residential in nature, uh, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to work with the property owner to see if we could reposition this to also include employment generating uses, uh, such as industrial, commercial, and as we're enjoying today, the construction of, of medical and healthcare related uh, development. Um, it's, uh, all utilities are in. Uh, so we really see this as a key site for uh, the employment generating uses that you see, medical, commercial office, MOB, which stands for medical office uh, building and industrial. Because we in the city, as part of our economic development implementation strategy, are looking for new opportunities to bring uh, high wage employment opportunities for our, our residents. The team, our real estate development team, um, is, is the real estate development office, but we also have uh, key professional services available to us. So DPS is a full service land planning and architecture firm. Kimley Horn is a full service civil engineering firm. Um, so you know, we can do all nature of required traffic analysis uh, in terms of origination, um, traffic impact analysis, we can do Alta surveys and topo and drainage surveys and site plans and all the necessary uh, narrative for, for PADs and so forth. So, so this is our team. Um, in my office, it's myself and one other, and, and we're the ones that uh, reach out uh, and try to get these public-private partnerships together uh, to move forward. So specifically for Peoria Place, uh, this is actually a really exciting night because this is nearing the end of a three-year journey to transition Peoria Place from the vacant parcels we've known for a long time into an exciting uh, mixed-use horizontal development. Uh, the work plan that, that really started this uh, was uh, negotiating with the property owner to, to move towards development. For the longest time, it was not being pursued for development for a whole host of reasons. So getting the property owner interested and motivated towards development was, was really the first step. And how we did that was by creating a whole development program uh, for the site, um, including uh, market-based uh, data, demographic data, uh, land uses, and so on and so forth, just to make the case that this property uh, can be positioned into a true mixed-use development that includes employment-generating uses. Uh, we uh, actually attracted um, Maricopa Integrated Health Systems, which is now ValleyWise, which was a huge uh, plus for the property in terms of bringing the anchor tenant to the development. Uh, confirming industrial and commercial office market through area brokers, uh, creating conceptual land use plans, uh, negotiating those plans and land use matrix with a property owner and land advisors, you know, initiating the PAD all the way down to uh, community meetings, all of that. Uh, you know, that, that was part of the work program uh, that, that we're happily nearing completion on. So to give you a sense of time frame, you know, we created the development program for the site in 2017. Uh, MIHS broke ground in 2018, and we initiated the PAD amendment in 2019. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been a significant period of time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Rick uh, to talk about the, uh, the PAD before us, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. Um, Good evening, Chairman, uh, Commissioners. Um, what a great introduction. Um, having said that, let's, let's take a little closer look at the site. As we stated, the 
subject site is 125 acres uh, in size. Uh, portions of it are just north of Cotton Crossing uh, with the majority of the project uh, south adjacent to Grand Avenue. As we stated earlier, this is a major amendment to the uh, previously approved Peoria Place uh, planned area development. Uh, more specifically, um, this amendment before you this evening essentially redistributes land use within the site. Uh, it updates the development uh, standards to accommodate those land uses that have been redistributed and, uh, and certainly a significant aspect of this as well as it revises the circulation pattern for the site. Uh, there is one existing use on the site uh, that we had spoke previously of, and that is the Maricopa County um, Integrated Health Systems. Uh, that is currently developed on, on parcel eight, which would be immediately adjacent to the southeast corner, I'm sorry, southwest corner of Cotton Crossing and uh, Grand Avenue. Uh, to the north of the subject site uh, are older single family detached homes, part of Old Town. Uh, west of the subject site, uh, Madison Estates and Roundtree Ranch, uh, again, single family detached homes, uh, as well as portions of the city of Peoria Municipal Complex. Uh, to the south, uh, again, are portions of Roundtree Ranch, as well as uh, industrial uses, and clearly to the east is, is Grand Avenue. Now, in order to really put this um, amendment in perspective before you this evening, we really need to take a look at the previously approved amendment. Uh, what you see here are, is the exhibit from the 2006 approved uh, uh, development standards plan. Immediately north of uh, Cotton Crossing is parcel one, which was originally designated as office. Uh, west of, uh, on the, of the site, uh, essentially they're in orange and yellow, are parcels two and three, which were equate to medium density residential, uh, five to eight dwelling units per acre. Uh, parcel four, the yellow uh, parcel there to the south, uh, low density residential, two to five dwelling units per acre. And specifically parcels uh, five, six, and seven, uh, immediately adjacent to Grand Avenue, uh, which were uh, originally designated as high density residential with a 15 to 15 plus dwelling unit per acre ceiling. Um, all in all, um, and then uh, I'm sorry, uh, parcel eight there as well, uh, which was town center mixed use. All in all, residential designations within this PAD essentially equated to about 82% of the overall uh, planned area development. Now we've talked uh, previously uh, about the Maricopa Integrated Health Systems coming in and that located in Parcel 8, which as I previously stated was originally designated as um, Town Center Mixed Use. Uh, that really created an anchor uh, for the subject site and really changed the complexion uh, of the site as, as time moved forward. So essentially before you this evening, they're proposing a revised land use plan that now um, uh, designates parcel one and two as Old Town mixed use. We'll come back to how parcels one and two uh, originated uh, a little bit farther down in the presentation, but this portion of the development now encourages the development of office and business, uh, retail uses that attract vehicular and pedestrian users, uh, more specifically, it really is set up now to um, um, support uh, the Old Town area, and obviously with the revised circulation plan, we have a direct connection there. Uh, parcel 3 uh, is being redesignated as high-density residential, 10 to 20 dwelling units per acre. It's intended to provide uh, multi-story apartments, condominiums, horizontal for rent product, and townhouses close to uh, employment and service areas. Uh, this is a slight increase over what was previously approved uh, for the site. Uh, parcel four is being
This meeting will now come to order. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Edwards. Must be. Oh, here. <laughs> Council Member Und. Here. And Council Member Dunn. Here. I wanted to make a point. I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Council Member Binsbacher. Here. Sorry about that. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of August 18th, 2020. We have one item on our study session agenda tonight, and that is the economic and budget update. And I will turn it over to our city manager, Jeff Time, to kick it off. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And of course, we did in the spring provide all of you with a, a financial update during our budget process. But of course, in the midst of that initial experience with the COVID-19 global pandemic, it was really a lot of uncertainty that was in the air. So as a result of the budget discussions, City Council did request that we do come back in, uh, in the, our August meeting to really get an update on uh, more of what are the trends and conditions as they stand here in the city of Peoria. So we have the good fortune of having Andy Granger, our deputy city manager, as well as Sonia Andrews, our chief financial officer, that can provide you the latest on our economy and how it impacts us here locally here in the city of Peoria. So I'll pass it over to Andy. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Um, yeah, like, like Mr. Tyne said, we're going to provide an economic and budget update. Uh, we provided a presentation in April. Um, this is an update to that, and you'll see that there's some promising news on the, on the horizon. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sonia, and she's going to start with the economic update, and then I'll follow with the budget update. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice little break. So back in April, we gave you an economic update that was rather alarming, and so hopefully today's economic update will be a little bit more encouraging. So let's start with what happened over the last seven months. Um, as you know, the U.S. economy technically entered into a recession in February. By the end of March, most of the world, including Arizona, was in some kind of lockdown or stay home order. And the economic contraction that followed was the sharpest in US history. And by April, it looked like we were headed for some very, very severe recession. Then the CARES Act kicked in. It was the largest relief package in US history, providing stimulus checks, PPP loans to businesses, and the extra $600 in weekly unemployment checks. That, along with the lifting of the stay-home order in mid-May, um, helped boost spending in the last three months. Now we have shifted to a recovery that is faster than most economists expect. But we still have a long ways to go. There are sectors of our economy that's still in deep recession, and there's millions of Americans still out of work. So there are other uncertainties affecting the recovery as well, which we will talk about more later. And um, although we're seeing a sharp recovery in consumer spending for the last three months, this recession is a deep recession. We usually look at GDP as an indicator of how deep recessions are. So let's take a look at GDP. As you can see, since the Great Recession in 2007 to 2009, we have had a long period of nominal GDP growth then with the COVID recession, the GDP has fallen by 11% um, for the first half of this year. That's the last two bars that are really significantly down at the end of the chart there. It's much steeper drop compared to the Great Recession so far. And this time around, most of the drop in the GDP is because of the sharp decline in consumer spending, which makes up 70% of GDP. So the major focus of this recession is the virus and consumer spending. And so what's going on with consumer spending right now? Consumer spending has been really interesting during this recession. Um, spending, as this graph shows, dropped by more than 30% in um, April compared to January before the uh, uh, recession. People were not spending money, staying at home, and they were also receiving the stimulus money at the same time. So household income and savings actually increased, which is unusual because a lot of times in recessions, household income and savings drop. But this time around, because people are staying at home and receiving stimulus funds, their income actually went up and savings actually went up. 
So in May, with the lifting of the stay-home orders and everybody having this extra money in the bank and the pent-up demand because they haven't been shopping, we saw a uh, sharp bounce back in consumer spending in May. And certainly the stimulus money you know, was the catalyst for this strong recovery in May, and it lasted the last three months. But even though the rate of recovery and growth is sharp and, and strong, the level of activity is still below pre-pandemic levels. Total consumer spending, as you can see here, which includes spending on all goods and services, nationally and in Arizona, is still down by 8% compared to January of this year. So, and also different categories of spending are recovering at different rates. Some categories are still very, very depressed. Um, so let's dive into some of these categories. The sectors that are still very much in a deep recession are, as we know, restaurants, hotels, transportation, entertainment, and recreation. Those are the uh, sectors of our economy that are still feeling the deep depression and still in the deep depression. And that's because the virus is still not under control. We still don't have a vaccine. And um, people are still fearful. So um, on the brighter side, Auto sales are seeing positive signs of recovery, and according to um, the National Automotive Dealers Association, auto sales continue to improve in July, but they say that sales have not recovered to a growth outlook yet. And we're always interested in auto sales because we have quite a few auto dealers here in Peoria. But it's a good sign that they are in, uh, seeing recoveries in sales. The other thing that's recovering significantly is spending on various consumer goods. Um, groceries have stayed very, very strong throughout this recession. In fact, as you can see on the graph, spending on groceries spiked by more than 80% in March with all the panic buying. Um, because consumers are not spending on travel and entertainment and recreation, they have more money to spend towards various personal and household goods. Everything from sporting equipment to jewelry to electronics to furniture, we have seen all that spending increase. But the big question is whether that increase and recovery in spending will continue when stimulus money runs out or is reduced, because we feel that a lot of that spending is spurred by uh, stimulus funds. The other thing to note in that the increase in spending on goods that are, are uh, shifted towards goods that are delivered and goods that are bought online versus goods that are sold in, in store. And um, so in-person store sales and services are still down. Businesses that depend on physical store sales and in-person services are still hurting and unable to um, open or return to full operations. And as of the end of July, um, we still have over 18% of small businesses that are not operating fully or not operating at all compared to January. Small businesses are a major force in our um, economy. It generates about 50% of GDP. With this pandemic, we don't yet know how many businesses will make it. Businesses that were not financially resilient before the pandemic may not survive. And also, um, jobs may be permanently lost. So um, let, let's talk about our job situation right now. In general, employment is improving, but it's still really bad. I hate to say that. As you can see, um, the bars represent initial jobless claims. It's dropped significantly, so that's good. Those are the people filing first-time claims. But there are still over 15 million Americans out of work. That's the red line that shows continuing claims, which are people staying on unemployment. Many economists project that unemployment will remain above 7% through 2021. Currently in the US, it's uh, like 10.2%, something like that. I think in Arizona, it's like 9%. So uh, the employment picture does not look good. So kind of in summary, um, how the economy will recover is still unclear to us. It all depends on consumer confidence in going out and spending again. Um, we are excited about the fast recovery we've seen in the last three months. 
Um, but there's still many uncertainties that remain that could change the shape of the recovery. Factors such as the virus, will there be a vaccine available? If there's spikes or second wave, will that you know, reverse the recovery? Um, uh, will there be more stimulus funds? Currently, the next round of stimulus has not passed the Senate yet, as you know. And of course, we talked about the employment situation. Will there, other thing is, will there be permanent shifts in consumer behavior and spending that will impact the recovery? Like I talked about the shift to um, online and delivery goods versus in-store sales, will that hurt all the businesses that depend on in-store and in-person sales and services? The Arizona economy was doing actually really well before the pandemic, so once the virus is under control, we hope to see a steady recovery. And so with all this is happening, how has that affected City of Peoria's budget, specifically our general fund revenue? So let's get into that. You've all seen this pie chart before. Um, it shows kind of the um, different revenues that support our general fund, which is our primary operating fund. 46% of, of our general fund revenues comes from sales tax, both local sales tax and state shared sales tax. We'll talk more about that later. But we also have other revenues that support the general fund. Um, property taxes is that little green slice up there. The housing market is actually still strong right now, and it seems to not be impacted significantly by the recession so far, so we're not worried about our property tax revenues for now. Uh, we have fees and charges from various services like parks and rec, development services, ambulance services. Some of these revenues, as you know, have been significantly impacted by the shutdown, but we hope that this impact is short term when we're able to reopen again. We hope that those revenues will return. We also receive income tax and vehicle license tax from the state. Income tax is expected to be down, as we all would anticipate, but we won't see that impact for a couple of years as there is a two-year delay in the state allocation. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll monitor those uh, revenues closely. So let's talk about sales tax. Um, This chart shows the uh, sales tax revenues that we collect, the local sales tax revenue, not the state shared, that the city of Peoria has collected each month for the last year. As you can see, April of this year was our lowest month of collections so far. The collections in April were down by as much as 13% compared to April of 2019. March was down by as much as 5% compared to March of 2019. But then in May and June, we saw a bounce back of 8% and 14% compared to the prior year. May and June sales tax collections were also stronger than in January and February uh, before the pandemic. And part of the reason we believe we uh, have the strong recovery in sales tax uh, is because we are not um, negatively impacted by those sectors that are still in deep recession. We don't have significant uh, sectors of our economy in the travel industry or entertainment industry or recreation. In fact, we really depend on stores like Walmart, Target, Amazon, grocery stores, and auto dealers. Those are the major payers of our sales tax. And as we know, uh, Walmart, Target, they, they never shut down. And in fact, they probably um, have increased in revenues from all the panic buying and all the groceries and household essentials that people are spending their money on right now. And Amazon especially pays sales tax and all the shift to uh, buying online has also benefited you know, Amazon and the sales tax we collect from them. So um, because of that, um, we actually ended up fiscal year 2020 in the general fund with revenues of 151 million. And essentially, we don't really have a shortfall for 2020 in our general fund revenues. Um, however, that said, we know that this uh, recession is a deep one. For the last three months, the recovery has been faster than expected. So we are more optimistic about fiscal year 2021, as um, Andy will go over the five-year projections later. However, we also know that certain sectors of the economy are still in deep recession, and small businesses that are still hurting and millions are still unemployed. So um, there are also you know, un uncertainties like, again, we talked about the lack of vaccine. We don't know what the virus is gonna do. We don't know whether uh, we will have continuous stimulus funds. 
So we must remain conservative as we do our financial planning for the next several years. And um, so that's really all I have for my section. If you have any questions, I can answer it or I can hand you over to Andy. Council, are there any questions for Sonia? Yes, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one question. I'm not gonna have you go back to the slide, but the one slide on open businesses, I saw a precipitous drop in April, I believe, and then it kind of ticked back up and back up. So my question is, are those actually businesses that um, are open for business or are those businesses new, the, when we start ramping back up on small businesses open, are those new businesses that are that are coming on board and actually opening up for the first time or are they just simply, hey, we were closed down for a little while and then we reopened? Because it seems like a really quick um, correction to that downward curve between March and April and it kind of comes up significantly for June. So, are those new businesses that reopened or are they just the same businesses that, hey, we were closed before and we're open now? And if you don't know, that's okay. Yeah. I am not sure. I okay. do know that this chart measures and looks at small businesses that have had transactions. Ah. So if they had transactions, they're considered open. That answers it then. So the, the, so the, the decline would be ones that had no transactions during the month. And then as they started having transactions again, they came back up and that's perfect. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Okay. Does anyone else? All right, thank you for that, Sonia. One thing, I, if I may, just to, to mention, and I know Andy we can go through this as well, for the, those in the audience that were not at our April study sessions that discuss this, is the city is very well positioned to support this. So while we see that there's a lot of volatility in different revenue streams, fortunately for Peoria, number one, as Sonia had mentioned, uh, the revenue streams we rely on are actually relatively doing relatively well. But in addition, we have significant reserves should something happen in the economy that does disrupt us, that we would be able to position ourselves long term. And I know Andy will discuss that a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, Sonia obviously presented an economic update. I'm gonna follow on with that and how does that uh, impact our, our budget forecast and what kind of actions are we gonna take? We still will have a structural deficit as you'll see, but it's much improved from where we were in April. So this is the, the forecast that we showed you in April. It uh, shows a structural deficit in fiscal year 23 of $13 million. Um, that was based on a prediction of a severe recession from almost every economist at the time that included a 20 to 30 percent prediction in GDP decline, record unemployment predictions, and a significant drop in consumer sentiment. Although all those factors came true, which is what the ec economists forecasted, uh, we have not seen the negative impact, as Sonia said, that we thought would happen to our sales tax revenue. Our March and April sales tax revenues did not decline as much as we forecast, and which improved our baseline budget for FY21 by approximately $4 million. So the bar chart that Sonia showed you where we had $151 million in revenue, which was a million dollars more than the previous year, we had actually, in this forecast, had a $3 million reduction in revenue. So that $4 million change helped us with our, with our baseline forecast going forward. And so what this shows is our updated um, general fund for, or, or, uh, general fund forecast for the next five years, which is significantly improved, as you can see, within fiscal year 25, a $7.5 million structural deficit. Um, as we said, this is primarily because of the record stimulus that was authorized. Um, however, a lot of this stimulus ended in July, um, so although it's positive, it's, it's unknown what's gonna happen in the future. So we showed that in, in May and June, and we, we think in July that we have positive, we're gonna have positive sales tax. Um, it's unknown what's gonna happen in August when the stimulus ends, and if we have a, a follow-up on a stimulus package, that will, make a, a, a bi that will be a big factor in how this forecast ends up. So our new forecast shows flat revenue growth in FY21, and then modest revenue growth in the following four years of two to 3% per year. And that's how you, we come to this, this forecast that we've got in front of you. However, uh, like we said, we still have a lot of variables. Um, when will a vaccine be approved and how effective will it be? And is there going to be an additional federal stimulus package? We'll be monitoring that and we monitor that on, on a weekly basis. Um, and, and we look at our forecast on a regular basis as we move forward. 
Another note is that we do include compensation assumptions for our labor groups and our, our non-represented employees in this forecast. So you see uh, revenue growth um, growing every year. Um, that's because we've assumed um, market adjustments or, or cost of living adjustments every year for the next five years for those groups. If, if we have um, a, a much more than expected downturn in the economy, then that's one thing that we can look at it to address our, our structural deficit. Because of the unknowns that we talked about with the virus and, and, and an additional stimulus package, what we're, what we're doing moving forward as an action plan is we, we believe we've got a range of a deficit. It's not just seven and a half million and that's what we're targeting. We think we've got a range. If the economy does better than we, what we thought in our projections, then we think that there might be a, as, as low as a $6 million structural deficit. If it does worse than we thought, then we, we potentially have up to a $9 million deficit we're planning on is, is a range of a six to $9 million structural deficit for the city. As Mr. Tyne mentioned, um, we've got a strong fund balance that uh, will help us weather this problem in the short term. Um, the fund balance includes one-time savings from FY20 that we did not move forward tr traditionally with that, the, those one time, the one-time funding, that it, which is savings from the previous fiscal year. We typically use that for capital projects and one-time supplementals in the following year. Because of our baseline budget that we that we um, approved this for this fiscal year, we've got that, we moved that to a fund balance above our reserve balance to help us with our, with our st structural deficit in the short term. We also um, utilized a portion of our CARES funding that we, um, that we for the, uh, our fund balance also, so that, that is a part of what our, our strong fund balance is. Um, this is what remained in our CARES funding after we funded several initiatives, including our business assistance programs with, that primarily fun, uh, are helps, helping support our small businesses during this pandemic, and our human and social services assistance programs towards for support of the pandemic. And an update will be given later in this council meeting on those um, programs. So although from a short-term perspective, we can use our fund balance to bridge a, stru a structural deficit. Long-term, that is not a, a, a principle that we use as part of our sound financial management to address a, a long-term structural deficit. So what we have looked at in the near term is a primary property tax shift from our secondary property tax to our primary pr property tax that we can do immediately to help address this issue and um, a, a, a shift in uh, transportation sales uh, general fund um, to fund our right-of-way maintenance from a city standpoint. We're gonna use transportation sales tax. We're gonna ship, shift our funding source for a portion of our right-of-way maintenance from uh, our general fund to our transportation sales tax. Those two um, measures will help us address about two, approximately $2 million of the structural deficit. And I should mention all of you, uh, these are proposals that we're putting forward to step. This is obviously something we would bring forward in the budget process, but these are obviously important policy issues for you to consider. We think those are, are relatively uh, straightforward and um, somewhat easy measures to put in place. The only impact that we would ha have from a, when we shift our secondary property tax to our primary pet property tax would be um, a reduction in our CIP funding. But from a staff standpoint, we recommend moving forward with that. We don't think, based on what our capital program is today, it will impact significantly our capital program. So that still leaves us with a four to seven million dollar structural deficit if we took those two measures into consideration, um, if this forecast holds true. So if the forecast holds true and we still have that four to seven million dollar deficit, what we plan to do is look at three different measures. One is department cuts. Um, we would look to uh, recommend uh, approximately a one to 2% across the board department cut um, for the city. Uh, currently we have our department directors looking at department cuts um, and we will look at those at the end of this year based on where we are when we look and when we see our actual revenues come in for the remainder of the year. As I stated earlier, we will also look at employee compensation as we stated. Um, we, um, as our labor contracts end, and as well as for our non-representatives, we've got an allowance for market adjustments and cost of living adjustments for the next four, four years. 
Um, but that's one way that we can adjust or, or address the structural deficit if, if we still have the structural deficit that we, we forecast at this time. And then lastly, um, as you're all aware, that we, we've got a public safety pension unfunded obligation um, that we fund at approximately $8 million a year to address that, that unfunded obligation. We've been looking strongly at ways we can save on that $8 million, and there's a couple different ways that we're evaluating that potentially reduce our costs towards our unfunded obligation. One is to use some of that fund balance that we've got above our reserves to apply against our principal and reduce our ongoing annual costs. And then the other one is to potentially issue pension obligation bonds that are, would have a lower interest rate than what we're paying right now for our annual costs. And that could potentially reduce that $8 million a year cost. We're still evaluating those. We're not sure if either of them are something that we would recommend, but we plan to come forward with you further in the fall um, based on what we, uh, we use. Our, we're, gonna, we're working with consultants right now to evaluate those measures to see if it's at the best interest of the city. So with that, in summary, Peoria, as, as Mr. Tyne stated, and uh, Peoria is well positioned financially to address this structural deficit, if we have one, um, which we forecast. We have a strong fund balance to bridge a short-term deficit, and we have an approach in place to address any long-term structural deficit as we laid out before you. This does not include layoffs, furloughs, or a severance package, um, and we are monitoring the economic situation closely to react to any situation that occurs. Um, as we stated, there's many variables, and that could change our forecast significantly moving forward. But we're um, looking at that closely, and uh, what, like we said, we'll be back to you in November for an update on this economic and budget forecast um, at that time. And with that, we can take any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor? Yeah, I think you, uh, thank you, Mayor. I think you answered my question, but I was going to ask about um, the department cuts, if that would um, be handled through normal attrition, or if that would be something we have to look at eliminating positions. So we, we do not, um, and, and part of our, our instructions to our departments was not to look at filled positions as cuts. Okay. So it would be travel expenditures, it could be vacant positions, it could potentially be positions that they expect to be vacant within the next year. Okay, great. I think, yeah, I think you addressed it here. I just want to be clear on that. Thank yes. you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Well, I, I really appreciate you guys putting this, putting all of this information together and um, sharing it with us as well as any of our citizens who are watching from home. I, I think the takeaway here is uncertainty. I mean, we still don't know if there's going to be more stimulus funding. We still don't know um, how soon there is going to be a vaccination and, and what we can actually believe in when it comes to that, um, that time. So it, it seems, you know, what we thought might be over and done with after a short you know, a short downturn and then a, a, a big uptick uh, did not turn out to be that way. And now we all have to kind of settle in for the long term. And so some of these things that you are looking at, um, such as PSPRS options, uh, refinancing, uh, other ways that you are looking at um, department cuts, as well as, you know, creative things like the right away allocation and the property tax shift, those are, those are um, creative and I appreciate it. And I know that all of our employees appreciate that, that we're looking at other things before we look at any kind of um, compensation reduction or employee reduction. So we all appreciate that, I know. Um, and so we are just settled in for the long haul and glad that we are always fiscally sound and we're not caught in a situation where something unexpected happened and we just can't deal with it. So we're happy and thankful that you guys are always uh, watching out for that kind of thing and making sure that we're not in a, in a detrimental situation when bad things happen, because bad things happen sometimes, don't they? All right, thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor. That is all we have for study session, and we'll look forward to the regular meeting. Thank you. We are adjourned until our 6 p.m. regular meeting.
Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Edwards. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carly. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Hunt. Here. Councilmember Dunn. Here. Board Member Johnson. Here. Board Member Heath. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of August 18th, 2020. Uh, you may have noticed some changes to the council dais. Everything looks different. It looks different from, from our point of view, for sure. This plexiglass is one of the many changes that we have put in place to um, protect all of us and all of those around us uh, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the council chambers, masks are required and capacity is limited. The barriers you see between us uh, allow us to conduct the business of the city council without a mask while controlling the possibility of transmission. For additional in-person and remote viewing and speaking measures, please consult the City of Peoria website. We will now begin the first of two Community Facilities District Board meetings. Per new Arizona state law, our board now consists of the City Council as well as two additional board members. We would like to welcome Jerry Johnson and Mike Heath, who will be joining us uh, on the dais for every CFD meeting uh, from now on. <laughs> We thank you both uh, really sincerely for volunteering for these very, very important meetings. So we will begin. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the Vistancia North Community Facilities District Board meeting. 4R is consider resolution regarding organizational matters, approving the general plan and development agreement, and calling a bond and property tax election for the Vistancia North Community Facilities District. And I will turn it over to Mr. Tyne to begin. Great, thank you, uh, Mayor and Board Member Carlett. And we have Sonia Andrews, the Chief Financial Officer for the city, and will serve as staff support for this board that will provide a presentation. Um, good evening, District Board. The item on your agenda tonight is a resolution to complete the organization of the Vistancia North CFD. And just as a recap, the CFD was formed by Council Resolution on June 16th. Once the resolution before you tonight is adopted, the district will then hold a bond and tax election next. And for the election, the ballot will only go to property owners in the district and currently, the only property owners are the developers and home builders. The ballot will not go to all residents in Peoria. And then on October 20th, uh, after the election, the district board will meet to canvass the election. So 
So the major components of the resolution that we're asking for your approval tonight include the following. Approving certain organizational matters, such as approving the officials of the city to take on the same role for the district as they do for the city. So the mayor and the vice mayor will be the district chair and the district vice chair, the city manager will function as the district manager and so on. The resolution also approves the general plan, the development agreement, and also calls the bond and property tax election. The general plan of the CFD lays out the infrastructure to be constructed in the district. For Vistancia North, the infrastructure to be constructed are the water and wastewater infrastructure listed here that will serve the area. Um, before I move to the next slide, are there any questions on this infrastructure to be constructed? I also wanted to mention that we have the developer um, representing uh, Vistancia North, Chris Reed, in the audience to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions with regards to the public improvements? Seeing none, please proceed. Okay. Um, so the resolution also approves the development agreement, which contains the major terms and conditions for the CFD, primarily the target tax rate of 265, debt terms, restrictions, and security requirements. The development agreement also requires the developer to provide a disclosure statement to all home buyers to make them aware of the CFD and tax obligations. And finally, the resolution orders and calls the bond and property tax election. As mentioned earlier, the election will only be for property owners in the CFD. The bond authority will request, uh, requested on the ballot will be for 50 uh, million and there will also be a request to authorize the operation and maintenance tax of up to 30 cents. And the proposed election date is Tuesday, October 13th. So that sums up the resolution before you. Staff recommends approving the resolution and I will answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Andrews? All right, seeing none, do we have a motion on item 4R? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, would the board please vote? Um, and we're going we're gonna to voice vote this evening, yay or nay. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Heath. Yay. Mr. Yes. Patel. Yes. 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 And I am also a yes, and that passes unanimously. Thank you. We will move on to item 5R, which is Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights Community Facilities District Board Meeting. 5R is consider resolution regarding organizational matters, approving the general plan and development agreement, and calling a bond and property tax election for the Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights Community Facilities District. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And Ms. Sanders will provide the staff report. Um, this resolution on your agenda is also to complete the organization of the Mystic at Lake Pleasant Heights CFD. The process for the Mystic CFD is the same as the process for Vistancia North CFD. And like the Vistancia North CFD, the only property owners receiving the election ballot for the Mystic CFD will be the developers and home builders. The resolution for Mystic CFD includes the same components as the one for Vistancia North CFD, so I won't go over these again. Um, the infrastructure to be constructed for the Mystic CFD include the El Mirage Road and related water and wastewater infrastructure and also other water and wastewater infrastructure to service the area. And again, we do have uh, the developer, David Rogers, in the audience if you have any questions regarding the development or these infrastructure improvements. Thank you, are there any questions? Just to reiterate, um, both CFDs that we are talking about tonight, in, in each case, there are no residents currently living within these boundaries, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Questions? Do I have a motion? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Will the board please vote, yay or nay? And we'll start with Mr. Heath. Yay. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. And I am a yes, and that is unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, we will now move on to an exciting occasion that occurs every year at the end of summer break. We get to meet our new Youth Council liaisons. Uh, the city of Peoria was the first Arizona city to implement the Youth Council Liaison Program in 2013, which allows two high school age students the opportunity to serve a one year ex officio term on the Peoria City Council. In these positions, the council liaisons sit at the dais along with mayor and council as we discuss the matters that impact our community. Liaisons receive council agendas in advance of the meetings with the opportunity to ask questions of department leaders prior to public meetings. Importantly, the non-voting liaisons may join in the debate and discussion that helps shape the city council vote. The liaisons will then report to the city's youth advisory board regarding key issues. At this time, I would like to invite the presiding municipal judge, George Anagnos, to the floor, along with the council youth liaisons, Sanvi Tiwari and Dom Van Winkle, to be sworn in. If you will kindly step forward to the council floor and meet the judge here by the podium. Come on down. Good evening, members of council. Good evening, members of the public. I'm ready to administer the oath of office. Good evening. If I could ask you both to please raise your right hands. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The laws of the Constitution. The laws of the Constitution of the United States, and the laws, and the Constitution of the state of Arizona. And I will faithfully perform the duties of the office of Council Youth Liaison to the best of my ability. Upon my oath, I do so swear. Thank you. Mayor and Council, members of the public, may we introduce to you and please give your applause to Council Liaison Congratulations. We will now take a short five minute recess while our newest members of the Peoria City Council are seated. Thank you.
Welcome back to the Peoria City Council meeting of August 18th, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Vinsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Hunt. Here. Council Member Dunn. Here. Council Liaison Tawari. Here. And Council Liaison Van Winkle. Here. Thank you. All right, we will begin with a, a few presentations this evening. The first item is the Vitalent Impact Award presentation. And I will turn that over to Council Mem to City Manager Jeff Tyne. <laughs> Great, and if I may, I'd like to introduce uh, Katie Gregory, our Deputy City Manager, who will provide us a report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I can tell you that uh, in my many years of being with City of Peoria, there's something I can always count on, and that is every year we have the opportunity, at least twice a year, um, as employees to go and donate blood. And um, I think that we have shown over the years how much our employees truly care by the number of, of donations we've been able to uh, do on an annual basis. Tonight, um, well, I should say in February, Vitalent held their annual awards um, program and recognized City of Peoria. And tonight we have Katrina Eaton here. She's a senior donor recruitment representative to make a presentation to council for the award. Um, again, we hoped to do it in March, but certain things happened and we weren't able to do it. So we're a little late, but no, in, in no way does that diminish uh, this award tonight. And certainly I'm excited to have Katrina share this with you. So I'd like to invite up Katrina Eaton, please, from Vitalent. So good evening, council members. Um, it is my pleasure to be here tonight to recognize everybody um, for earning the Impact Award. So on an annual basis, uh, we partner through Vitalent with over 1,600 organizations that sponsor blood drives. Um, our most dedicated groups, we have over 600 of them that annually win awards um, with our Valentine's for Life program. And we, as it was stated, we have um, that recognition um, event taking place February 14th around Valentine's Day every year. So we wanted to briefly go over um, the achievements from the city of Peoria. Um, at Vitalent, we are formerly United Blood Services. We provide the blood to all the hospitals here in Maricopa County. We require 600 donors every single day just to keep pace with the blood that's used here across the state. Um, you guys have a huge contribution towards that. Um, for um, 2019, we had a total of five blood drives held, 235 units of blood collected, and every one donation we receive can potentially help save three hospital patients. The whole blood goes to help accident and trauma victims, the plasma goes to help burn and shock patients, the platelets are critically used for um, cancer and chemotherapy patients. Um, throughout uh, last year, we have um, the Platinum Award. So because three drives, more than three drives were held throughout the year, um, we had that opportunity for everybody. But the only city to earn um, our highly coveted Impact Award, we had 51 winners out of 1,600 people um, that are organizations and sponsor awards. So a very high honor. And um, I left hand sanitizer, so if you would like to handle the award, um, you can keep safe. And um, one of the things, rest assured, um, through this new environment, um, the blood drive is a sterile event, um, but it is, per it is um, created through purpose and passion. And that's certainly what is exemplified through you guys with our drives with Peoria. So over the summer, we didn't have the, um, quite the participation um, we usually expected. And so um, this year we did. Last year we had a smaller than usual drive. So a September drive was planned. And that was one of the driving forces um, that helped um, create um, the situation where you were able to earn, earn this award. So we really wanted to recognize um, the leadership of our coordinators, Mindy Russell, um, Karen Caviles, and Maureen Marquez. And uh, we are super grateful. And as we are kind of going through this new environment, we wanted to really recognize the drive that was held um, at this um, city council in July. We had over 112 donations, and um, that is the second highest amount of blood we've collected ever. And you guys are second only to the city of Phoenix, which is about five times larger. 
So we are very grateful. Um, you know, life doesn't stop, and um, we still need all of that blood. We especially need convalescent plasma donations. So when somebody gives, they do have the ability to have that antibody test to determine if they can directly help a patient. So we do ask for everybody's continued support, and we look forward to you guys achieving this honor next year as well. Thank you. Thank you. It is a great honor for us, and we so appreciate the award. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we will now move on to the next presentation. This is a proclamation recognizing August as Drowning Impact Awareness Month. And as you can see, we are all wearing purple in support of this very important issue. And we will begin with um, the reading of a proclamation, which I will do right now. It looks like this. It's very fancy. And it has a lot of whereases. Whereas Arizona's future prosperity depends upon the long-term health, safety, and well-being of the nearly 2 million children and teens in our state. And whereas drowning is a top cause of injury and death for children and teens in Arizona, affecting not only the victims, but also families, emergency personnel, and our society as a whole. And whereas Child drownings are nearly 100% preventable, including drownings which are classified as maltreatment and make up an average of one in four cases in Arizona. What a shame. Whereas research proven strategies can save lives, including constant and capable supervision, restricting access to water, use of life jackets, swimming lessons for adults and children at the appropriate age, rapid emergency response, including CPR, and safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and communities to break the cycle of maltreatment. And whereas awareness of the problem is just the first step, evidence-based programs to bring these strategies to families is the best way to save lives. And whereas during the month of August, the Drowning Prevention Coalition of Arizona in collaboration with Phoenix Children's Hospital, state and local governments, community organizations, and private citizens will be engaging communities throughout Arizona in a coordinated and comprehensive response. Now, therefore, I, Kathy Carlett, Mayor of the City of Peoria, Arizona, do hereby proclaim August 2020 as Drowning Impact Awareness Month and urge all communities and citizens of Arizona to participate in efforts to reduce drowning risk, strengthen families, and protect children and teens. Mr. Sefton, take it from here. Mayor, thank you. Your whereas is say it all. <laughs> and many times these, these proclamations get to be celebratory in, nation, or in nature. This one is not. This is about awareness fact that as of July or August 5th, in just Maricopa and Pinal counties, 93 water-related incidents have occurred, 52 of them with kids under five, four children, three teens, and 34 adults. Drownings are preventable. We've broken it down as simple as the ABCs, adult supervision, barriers to water, and classes, classes make a difference. On behalf of the Parks and Recreation Community Facilities team and especially our aquatics folks who really endeavor to teach lessons, teach water safety, teach the lifelong enjoyment of being around water and being in water, um, it's an honor for me to listen to your whereas, Mayor, <laughs> and to celebrate uh, our successes while the, every tragedy happens um, I want to recognize the impact is wide. When we think about the individual, the individual's families, but we often forget about the other people, the first responders, the first responders, the police officers and the firefighters that end up on that scene, the tragedy that they feel in saving those lives when they can or dealing with the families when they can't. The, um, Drowning Prevention Coalition of Arizona has been steadfast in, pro in promoting the awareness of drowning prevention and providing grief support for those families that suffer. 
This is one of those opportunities for us as a community to come together and continue to be vigilant in our awareness and that water is a silent killer. And we continue to invest in our programs, our classes, our facilities in the communities. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, the Mayor and Council. And thank you to the community for being a, paying attention and, and paying attention to the A, Bs, and Cs of water safety. Thank you. Thank you. And we will also be lighting City Hall purple beginning this evening for the rest of the week um, to remind people of everything that you just said. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will now, for the next presentation, turn it over to Vice Mayor Mike Finn, who is the chair of the Council Subcommittee for Boards and Commissions, and he is going to recognize our newest Boards and Commission members. Thank you, Mayor. We need to find a new way to pass papers back and forth. But, uh, if you'd please turn your attention to the screen for a short video. Um, due to some necessary changes put in place to enable social distancing, we had to modify our, our tradition of formally presenting the certificate of appointment to new board and commission members at a council meeting. Instead, the new members that were appointed on May 5th were invited to send a picture of themselves holding their certificate of appointment so we could recognize them and celebrate their service to the city. As I read each name, their photo will appear on the screen. I will start with Fawaz Ali. There's Fawaz, sharp dressed man right there. Nice work. Um, next is Elena um, Adrayeva. Next is Larissa Andreeva. Twins, if you didn't catch that on the screen. Next is Chloe Innocencio. Congratulations, Chloe. Next is Dominique Luna. Big smile on Dominique, I like that. And finally is Luke Solomon. Luke's looking pretty good there too. Got his cuffs rolled up there on the suit, looking good. So congratulations to all of you and thank you for um, taking the interest in, in uh, joining the Youth Advisory Board. That's great, thank you very much. Good job on those names. <laughs> all right, we will now move on to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion unless a Council member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence on the agenda. Tonight's consent agenda items um, consist of a public hearing. If there is a member of the public present who wants to address a public hearing on the consent agenda, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. This item will be removed from the consent agenda and heard at the normal course of the regular agenda. I have not received any speaker request forms. All right, council, are there any items to be removed from consent? All right, seeing none, is there a motion on the consent agenda? No motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. Thank you. We will now move on to the regular agenda and new business. Item 27R, Intergovernmental Agreement, Peoria Unified School District, on-site learning and support services. And I will turn it over to City Manager, Jeff Time to begin. Great, thank you, Marin. Uh, as Peoria families start up the new school year, we find ourselves under very fluid conditions. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, in an effort to try to adapt to the, the changing conditions, we're working with a long-standing partner that we have, a partnership with the Peoria Unified School District, where, we, of course, we have provided uh, before and after school care for a number of years, uh, but we are looking at additional opportunities that we can to adapt to the current conditions. We also have in the audience Michelle Myers, the Chief Financial Officer, who will provide support as well if there are any questions. Uh, from uh, for the school district and with that I'll pass it to Chris Hallett our neighborhood and human services director Thank You mr. Tyne mayor council. We are ex very excited to be here again today to sho showcase another Great example of our longtime partnership. We've had with the Peoria Unified School District It's take a lot of uh, Effort on both sides to get us to where we're at for yet another IGA and I have with me here uh, who I informally like to call our chief 
relationship officer when it comes to the PUSD <laughs> relationship. Uh, she's worked very hard with uh, her counterparts over there at the district. Uh, she's well versed in this and we're gonna have her walk us through the IGA presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here today with, uh, before you to talk about the on support plan and partnership opportunity. While we are separate entities, the City of Peoria and the Peoria Unified School District has a very long standing partnership and we both strive to serve and support the children in our community. In accordance with Governor Ducey's executive order, 2020-51, uh, each school district shall begin offering free on-site support opportunities for students who need a place to go during the school day, as required by the executive order of 2020-41. Please note that the on-site spaces are expected to open on August 17th and allow students a safe place to come, log in, work on their online coursework, and a supervised environment. The on-site support opportunities are not the same as an engaging environment, engaging classroom environment. Um, they do not include an in-person instruction certified teacher. The intent of the governor's order is to serve the more vulnerable students in our district, such as ch children of first responders, those with special education services, English language learners, homeless and foster care students. This order was in effect so quickly, the district was faced with a short time frame to provide on-site opportunities for students who need a safe place to connect and complete their online learning. We were thrilled that the district reached out to us and asked if we were willing to expand our partnership. As Mr. Tyne noted, Michelle Myers is in the audience to help support that. Maybe. Sorry. Got it. Excuse me. Um, the on-site support model um, is really made up of um, the normal school day hours um, from 8 to 3 for elementary students and 7.20 to 2.20 for the high school students. Um, campuses are determined based on the need of the existing capacity and Peoria Unified will partner with the City of Peoria for some program delivery. The staff to student ratio is 1 to 15 and students are grouped by grade level, minimum time requirements, kindergarten, first through third, fourth through eighth. We'll have nurses on campus to be able to provide um, support for all the healthcare needs um, during those operation hours. And the program will run Monday through Friday. However, on Wednesday, the school district um, calls Wednesdays modified Wednesdays, and that time is from eight to one for elementary schools and 7.20 to 1220 for high school students. The city of Peoria locations are as followed. Um, we currently have seven of the 18 locations providing on-site support. This is also offered at all the high school student, uh, high schools as well. The current enrollment in the Peoria schools is 246 out of the 426 currently registered. PUSD will operate 11 additional locations at the Peoria sites as well. The fiscal impact, um, our costs are truly the cost of staffing um, to be able to support the online opportunities. Um, this includes a Recreation Leader 3, two Recreation Leader 1s at each location, which approximately about 50 students per site. The fiscal impact to the city is 1,600 per site per week with the weekly impact of 14,400 to serve up to nine sites. The initial cost for the three, peak, three week period ending September 4th will be 43,200 with possibility of a four week extension and additional $57,708 would be needed. Expenses will be charged to the current AMPM budget if approved, um, reconciled with available care funds, care act funds if necessary. The PUD partnership will continue to, uh, will contributing up to approximately 296,000 um, to the sites as well that we're serving. 
this just doesn't want to click for me. There you go. Um, our recommendation is to approve the intergovernmental agreement between PUSD and the city of Peoria and funding in the amount not to exceed $101,000. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Council, are there any questions? No? Um, I appreciate you breaking this into two different um, pots of money. Um, I think it's very optimistic, <laughs> and I hope that we only have to use the first, the first stretch of, of time and funds there, and then we can all go back to, to normal. I, I don't know if I can even say normal anymore. I'm not sure there is a normal. Um, all right, then. Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item is the rezone Cowley property southwest of Ridgeline Road and Dysart Road, 28R. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. Chris Hawkins, our planning director, will present on the next item, and this is a rezoning case in the northern part of the city. This is an action item. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Tyne and uh, Mayor and Council. Welcome back. It's good to see everyone again. Um, agenda item 28R, this is a proposal to rezone approximately 280 acres generally located west of Trilogy at Vistancia. Uh, the site is identified in red on the screen. The applicant tonight is Susan Dimmitt from Gamage and Burnham. She represents the applicant, Madame Holmes, and the landowner, Cali Management. So the request this evening is to rezone the site from its current Suburban Ranch 43 zoning to a planned area development. So for those that may be watching, a PAD is a customized zoning district that pertains to a specific development program. We've got lots of PADs throughout the city. So if proved tonight, uh, the rezone would facilitate the development of the site into a single family residential community with a maximum unit count of 838 lots. Okay, and this slide will focus more on the site and area context. Again, the property is identified in color on the screen. Um, we've elected to make a distinction between what we are calling the north parcel and what we are calling the south parcel. So between those two is the dynamite road alignment. And the reason for the delineation is that Madame Holmes is intending to develop the north parcel, whereas the south parcel right now would be developed by a future buyer. Additionally, as I talk through the timing of infrastructure, there is a delineation between um, the uh, wood infrastructure is tied to the north parcel and the south parcel. And finally, towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk about the abandoned mine, the abandoned mine for your references on the south parcel. Topographically, the site has two major wash corridors that converge into one. The wash corridor runs from the northwest portion of the north parcel to the southeast portion of the south parcel. The uh, north parcel also has some hillside areas that then extend westward into some private land. There's also some hillside parcels on the south parcel that extend into state land on the west side of that. So if we were to look at a land ownership map, uh, this is a pocket of private land that's located west of Estancia. Um, if we were to zoom out a little bit, you would see a vast area of state land that's located to, uh, to the south, west, and north of this pocket of private land. Okay, so we'll talk about the general plan designations on the property. Um, as you know, this is not zoning, but rather the desired future land uses and densities uh, that, are, that are out there. Uh, as you know, the general plan is the city's foundational document guiding future growth decisions. It sets the policy framework. Here we are looking just at land use, but as you know, it addresses 24 topical areas, things like water, economic development, housing, and a number of other topical categories. So the site in question has two land use designations. So the area in yellow is designated as traditional residential, has a corresponding density of two to five units per acre, and the areas in green are park open space, and these typically signify sensitive areas like wash corridors and hillside areas. Now, I should note that this pocket of land, um, uh, including areas with distancy, have essentially retained the same land use designations for quite some time, for decades, actually. Now, as you might recall, earlier this year, back in April, uh, the city approved slight modifications to the general plan map as a minor general plan amendment. 
So the purpose of that minor amendment was to better align land use with the uh, topographical features on the site. So in this case, the result was that there was a uh, reduction in the land designated for residential, and there was a corresponding increase in the land designated for park open space. And we don't always see it that way, do we? Um, so the general plan amendment uh, looks at land use appropriateness. So it moved forward separately back in April. It was all due to timing because we were trying to get the general plan amendments wrapped up so they could then be placed on the ballot for consideration uh, later this fall. Um, but unlike the general plan amendment, uh, tonight we're talking about the rezone. And the rezone uh, pertains to the development program that, uh, and includes all of the relevant uh, development standards. So that's what we're, that's all part of the rezone application. There we go. This graphic illustrates the zoning in the area. Now, zoning is tied to specific parcels and identifies what can be done today and what are the standards today. So the site happens to be zoned today as Suburban Ranch 43. In fact, all the areas in green uh, are SR 43. The Suburban Ranch District allows one and two story homes throughout the whole area. And it's, if you were to look at all of the undeveloped areas throughout Peoria, they have, a, they have a zoning designation of agricultural or SR 43. And the reason for that is that we hold these areas in a less intense state until a development plan comes before the city. And then when it does come before the city, we look at it for its conformance to the general plan. So our objective and our assessment is, does it uh, conform to the general plan? And in this case, park open space and uh, residential two to five units per acre. Um, so the applicant tonight is proposing a PAD zoning. This is a type of zoning district that allows us to uh, tailor the standards for the circumstances in the area. So in that regard, we can have a lot size mix. We can um, institute specific buffer conditions. We can limit uh, housing height and areas, and we can have standards that better align with topography. And that's what we're doing in this case. Um, the density for this rezone is three units per acre. So it's gonna be right within the range of the two to five unit per acre that the general plan uh, proposes for this area. So let's talk about the specific development program right now. So what you're looking at is the entire north and south, south parcels. Uh, again, a maximum of 830 dwelling units. There are two major phases of development. There's the north parcel, which is about 120 acres, a little shy of 300 units are projected. And then the south parcel, um, 160 acres, about 541 units. They're proposing, as you can see on the screen, three uh, minimum lot sizes throughout the development. Um, there are standards within the PAD that specify that as the lots uh, are, are um, um, considered through the subdivisions, that at least 50% of them have to be at least have to be over 7,000 square feet, and a quarter of them have to be over 8,000 square feet. So that provides a little diversity in the house, housing lot matrix, and also it, these lots happen to be um, very compatible, very com uh, comparable to the uh, lot sizes in the area. So that is the north parcel there. And here's the south parcel. So this is the future parcel. This is the parcel that I'll point out where the abandoned mine that I'll talk about later. And later I'll talk about also one of the um, conditions placed on it. You can see the eastern 75 feet have been reserved as a green belt. And then there's also a stipulation in the packet that says any lot within 100 feet of Trilogy along the eastern boundary is limited to actually one story. They're limited to one story. And this aligns with Granite Hills, which is located to the north, that's the Taylor Morrison development, and Ashton Woods, uh, um, Sonoran Place, uh, north of that. So it's got a seamless boundary along the east. All right. There we go. Open space and amenities. Uh, this graphic illustrates the recreational side of the development. So approximately one-third or 81 acres are held as open space. They're comprised as natural open space. This includes the major wash quarters that I identified earlier and the hillside areas. These are recreational components that provide connectivity throughout the development. There's also active open space areas. So I think you can see these green stars on the map. They're distributed throughout the site. There's a maximum of six pocket parks that are required. Um, each pocket parks has to have at least a three design features and there's a number of design features that are identified in the PAD. I'll note that uh, these uh, pocket parks are all, um, they're, so in addition to the pocket parks, there's also localized areas. So when each subdivision comes in, they have to have their localized open space to meet our design review manual. Now, because the, the absorption and the build-out occurs over phases and over time, 
um, when the resident profile is known, um, the um, specific identification and programming features um, are identified through what we're calling a recreation and amenities master plan. So that's something, that, a document that the applicant prepares for each phase. They submit to the city. It's reviewed by planning and also the parks director. Uh, we, 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 at that point, we'll understand the specific uh, open space areas and connections, and that's um, approved as part of the plat applications. There we go. Um, this graphic illustrates the roadway improvements and timing. All the elements are tied to a preliminary traffic analysis, and the timing is, a, is tied to which parcel develop and when. So first of all, if we look at the north parcels, they're going to develop in phases. It's not going to develop all together, but um, these will be the roadway improvements. These include Dysart Road, the half street improvements um, throughout the north side. It includes Ridgeline Road and 135th Avenue. That goes to the northwest. Morning Vista Lane, and that's going to be dependent on whether this project develops first or the one to the north develops. Hacienda is at White Peak, so there happens to be a joint development agreement between the applicant and the developer of Hacienda is at White Peak. The timing between which one goes first is unknown, and that's why we have stipulations that address those scenarios. Um, Dynamite Road, which separates the north and south parcel, um, inner improvements are identified, and then Probably the, the, uh, the item that's brought up the most questions, that's the Dysart Road connection, particularly down to Jomax Road. So the way that would occur would be that um, the, let me show you the south parcel now. So when the south parcel comes in, the full Dysart Road interim and full improvements would be done. However, there is a caveat that um, in, the, in the north parcel, um, they would, the developer would have to develop an interim Dysart Road connection either at the earlier of the last phase of the north parcel or the opening phase of the south parcel. It's very possible and it's probably very probable that that interim connection would be made at the last phase of the north parcel. So that'll provide an interim roadway connection down to Joe Max Road. As you know, the two-lane roadway also goes all the way down to Happy Valley, so that provides that second uh, point of connection throughout the community. Excuse me, Chris, before you move on from that slide, I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly. Um, as the north parcels develop, you will have connectivity through Ridgeline Road only. And then as the, when the north parcels are completed, then there will be connectivity through the uh, Dysart all the way through the south parcels, and that will go all the way down to Joe Max. Correct. There will only be an interim connectivity. E what does that mean? Yes, so what that means is um, either when the, the last phase of the north parcel happens or when the south parcel starts to develop, and I think it'll be the last phase of the north parcel, at that point, they have to develop an a interim roadway condition that connects the development all the way down to Joe Max Road. That's a two-lane roadway. It's an interim roadway there. And so when the south parcel develops, then the Dysart Road within the south parcel has to then assume a full roadway width, curb gutter, sidewalk, all improvements, okay. and the last bit still remains an interim condition because that will develop into a full condition when state land parcel develops in that piece. So just to be clear here, the last phase of the north parcel, that's when that ultimate connection as an interim condition will be down to Joe Max, if that makes sense. Okay. Just so to make sure that I have this correct. Um, so that interim roadway of Dysart is going to go through state land from the south portion of the south parcel all the way down through state land to Joe Max. Correct. Okay. That's right. and, and so does this development agreement here already consider the state land obligations and state land approval of all of that? Absolutely. All the roadway stipulations and timing and obligations are all part of the ordinance. Okay. Yes. Okay. And Thank so you. the unit count absorption is all tied to the traffic study that's been prepared. Okay. And it, I'm sorry, did you say it was tied to unit count? Well, the, the, the traffic impact analysis looks mm -hmm. at the, the number of units that are developed and the roadway infrastructure that's necessary to serve that area. And then as more units are developed, they need broader infrastructure. So it's all tied to a traffic analysis. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, let's talk about public outreach. Um, as you know, we, we send out an application when we, when we first get the application, it's called notice of application. And we also send it out uh, prior to a notice of, well, notice of hearing. It goes out to all owners within a, a quarter mile radius and all registered HOAs within a one mile radius. I will point out that, you know, we have one of the most expansive notification radiuses in the valley here. And I will point out that for the purposes of tonight's hearing, we did have a lot of public comment. 
So uh, in addition to these methods, um, anyone that was a party of record, we also sent them a email notifying them of the meeting tonight, regardless of whether they're in the impact area or not. So they did get an email there. We also published a legal ad in the paper and the site uh, was posted in two locations with our requirements. As you know, every rezone requires a neighborhood meeting. This one was held August 7th of last year at Vistancia Elementary. We had 31 attendees. Um, the concerns at that time that were identified, there were there was questions, concerns about the adequacy of infrastructure, public safety, schools, roads and water. Uh, we had a lot, most of those residents, I believe, were from Trilogy of Estancia, and they were um, asking about the buffer condition, the one-story limitation along the eastern boundary, and there was also questions about construction timing and traffic infrastructure. And then we went to Planning and Zoning Commission on January 16th, and prior to Planning and Zoning Commission, we hadn't received any formal letters of opposition. We had just received the, the concerns at the neighborhood meeting that we worked through. At the Planning Commission meeting, we had eight speakers present. Um, the speakers present were both from Trilogy and Trilogy West, and on the screen you can see some of the similar concerns that were debated, that were talked about at the neighborhood meeting. Um, new ones that came up were the disposition of the abandoned mine. Um, we started hearing for the first time concerns about, um, from Trilogy West residents wanting a one-story limitation for the development. Uh, questions about timing development, there were concerns about developments were going to displace wildlife and light pollution. And as you know, we do have a dark sky ordinance, so when the subdivision comes in, they have to comply with that. A little later, I'm going to talk specifically about the uh, one-story limitation that's desired by Trilogy West, and I'll talk about the, the abandoned mine. Okay, oh, let me back up one thing. Let me just mention, and as you can see it on the screen, that at the Planning Commission, after deliberation, they voted six to one to recommend the approval of the rezone, and at that time, the general plan amendment. So there's been several months that have transpired between January and today, and so the reason for that uh, delay was after the Planning and Zoning Commission, we did get 35 emails, and so those emails are all in your packet. They're um, identified as Exhibit 8, um, and we also um, received, after time of printing of this packet, and tonight we received an additional eight, and so we've provided those to you tonight. Um, all of those letters are from Trilogy West, and the concerns that they bring up there, they, they talk about traffic conditions, the adequacy of the schools, uh, the schools in the area, but the most prominent issue they identify, and this is um, very consistent throughout all the emails we got, is a desire for a one-story limitation from Trilogy West residents uh, north of Ridgeline. So I'll talk about that specifically in a minute. Um, we also received a second letter from uh, Peoria Unified School District. And as you all know, the, the siting, funding, and operation of schools, this is the delegated responsibility of the state, and, it's, and it happens through its school districts and governing boards. So while the district did, um, uh, did uh, note outstanding concerns about uh, capacity of schools in the area, they have come to terms with uh, Madame Homes towards a voluntary assistance agreement. So this is a type of agreement whereas the um, developer pledges an amount of money to the district for each unit that is constructed. So they've, they've come to terms for that agreement. Um, we also received correspondence during this time from the Arizona State Mine Inspector and also the Office of the Attorney General. Um, they, ins they informed the city about their concerns about the safety of the abandoned mine, namely what they were talking about were the, the incidents of the high walls that are out there and the unrestricted access. So I'll, again, I'll discuss this in a minute, uh, more in a minute. So first let's talk about the buffer conditions here, okay? Um, so when we think about residential districts throughout the city, there's a uniform standard. They can, all homes can be one or two stories, and this is throughout the district, throughout the city rather. And the purpose for that is to allow for product diversity and to respond to different market needs. Some people want two-story homes, some people want one-story homes. Now, when Sonoran Place went through the zoning process, um, we heard from Trilogy at Vistancia residents that they desired a buffer as they directly abutted Sonoran Place. And, um, and uh, at that time, uh, Councilmember Binsbacher pushed for a buffer condition along the Eastern Corridor, which was implemented as part of that development plan. So what was instituted was the same 75-foot buffer and a one-story limitation for any lot within 100 feet. That um, uh, prescription was also carried forward when Granite Hills to the south came in, because again, they directly abutted Trilogy of Estancia, and as with this development as well, it's part of the stipulations, they will have the same condition. So you'll have a seamless buffer along the east where they directly abut uh, Trilogy of Estancia. So whereas those three developments um, abut Trilogy, um, this development doesn't uh, abut Trilogy West. So 
What I'll point your attention to is the area along Ridgeline Road. Um, when you factor in the right-of-way width of Ridgeline Road, that's an arterial roadway. That's about 110 feet. When you consider the open space on the north side and the open space on the south side, you have separation that will range anywhere from 250 to 400 feet between the nearest lot on Trilogy West and the nearest lot in, uh, in, uh, in this development. So that's a, you know, a, a much better separation than, than it's provided along the eastern boundary with that, uh, with, uh, uh, trilogy of Estancia. So um, for that reason, um, there was no restriction that was proposed as on this development on that edge condition. Also because we also didn't place that on Sonoran Place and so we're trying to provide for a little bit of uniformity as well with that. So for those reasons, Planning Commission staff did not recommend a one-story limitation along the north or throughout the development. All right, so now let's talk about that abandoned mine on the south parcel. Okay, um, so I stated earlier, we got a letter from the estate mine inspector. They had, um, they advised the city of enduring concerns about the state of the abandoned mine on the south parcel. Now the mine was purportedly abandoned back in 2007 uh, prior to the parcel being purchased by the current landowner. Um, the Arizona state mine inspector, they have the statutory enforcement over mines. And so this case, um, th th this was an opportunity to address the present condition of the mine. So all relevant parties, and that included the city, Mattamy Homes, the landowner, we all met with uh, the state mine inspector and the attorney general's office and discussed those concerns. And so through those discussions, all parties agreed to a framework that would um, uh, deal with the interim condition or the, the prime safety condition of the high walls and then final remediation. So what we've included in your packet is exhibit nine is the interim mitigation plan. This was a plan that was uh, all parties have agreed to and it was accepted by the Arizona State Mine Inspector. We've also updated the conditions of approval to this case. So if you were to look at exhibit three, you'll see where those new conditions that the Planning Commission hadn't seen that relate specifically uh, to this mine. So I'll go through generally what those conditions are uh, related to the mine. So if council was to take action tonight to approve the case, the applicant has 90 days from tonight to put the interim mitigation plan in place. And this includes knocking down the high walls, whether through bulldozers or blasting, and then recontouring the line, uh, the, recontouring the land to at least a two to one slope. So we're, we're um, leveling out that, those high walls. Within this time frame, they also have to provide secure perimeter fencing around the boundary. They have to provide regular signage and they have to actively monitor it. So if there's ever any trespass and, and the fences, uh, uh, broken through, they have to repair that and, and restore that uh, secure fencing. Also, as we work through it, uh, the city is requiring an indemnification instrument from the um, applicant that protects and holds the city harmless from any unauthorized trespass to the mine on the southern parcel. So right now, the city and the applicant are working through the, um, you know, the wording and the, and the, um, of that uh, indemnification. Now, if these three measures were not in place within that time frame, then the stipulation says that the city would halt any permits that might be in place until those items are, are put in place and corrected. So final remediation, um, so that occurs when the plat uh, for the south parcel comes in. So when we know how the south parcel is going to develop, we know how the lotting configuration, how the, how the um, uh, drainage is going to work, the grading is going to work, because we don't know that right now, but when we do know that in the future, that's when the final remediation, the final mitigation plan is required and that identifies all the ultimate remediation measures and timing. And so, of course, at that time when that develops, it, it produces it to a developable condition and that's at the time when it will have to then be um, um, situated in a manner where development can occur on the mine. And so when you look at the development plan, there is, there are homes and development plan for that area. All right, I'm almost finished here. <laughs> Chris, can I ask you yes, a question um, before you move on from that? You bet. What, um, what is entailed in final remediation? Is that is that the desert back to its original state? Yeah, that's place. That's uh, um, mayor, members of the council. Essentially, that is restoring the mine because it'll be to a two to one slope. That's restoring it to a condition where it can then be developed because. Um, you know, you can't really do a final uh, mitigation plan today because they don't know how the lotting is going to go or the final grading is going to be. So when they do know that they, and they plan to develop the south parcel, they have to put that plan in place and institute those measures to put it in a developable condition. So that all happened when the first south parcel, first plat in the south parcel develops. 
So developable condition is one thing, but if they're not putting a home on it, is it back to its, its natural desert state? The um, final mitigation plan would occur when we get the first plat of the south parcel, because prior to getting the first plat, we don't really understand how the final grading is gonna be or, or, or the, that condition. So it's when the first plat comes in, that's when, we'll, that's when we require the final mitigation. Okay. But, but just, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yes. I'm just gonna say that the, the mine still has to be fenced and we still have um, remediated all of the safety concerns that the state mine inspector identified, which were the high walls. So remediation is safety, it is not restoration. Correct, interim, interim mitigation is safety. Final remediation is um, restoring it to developable condition. So there's a pretty large difference between developable and restoration back to its desert. I mean, if there are areas that are not being developed, they will still look like a mine or will they look like a desert? Um, Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I believe so. I think what you're asking is, and if I was to show the development plan, they, there are plans for residential development where the mine now exists. So to prepare that land for that future residential development, they would have to recontour it and, and grade it so it drains properly and do all those measures to make it in a state where you can develop the property. So all of the places where a mine currently is will have homes. There will not be open space. I, I think there's a uh, combination of open space and homes, but I think they haven't done the specific lotting program for the South Parcel yet because they don't have a buyer yet for that area. But when they do uh, have a buyer and they do know how they're going to develop it, then we'll have a better idea. But if they're looking at the land plan, Yes, there's a, there's a large area, particularly around the hillside and near the mine that are open space, and there's also areas closer to the mine that are, that are residential. And so the areas, I'll, just say, I'll say this one more time. Sure. The areas that are not residential but are open space, will they be restored back to the original state of a desert, or will they still look like a mine? Chris, I can maybe help a little bit with this one. Sure. Thank you. Um, the city doesn't make a determination about what is required. The Arizona State Mine Inspector's Office will, as they do with all mines, they, are, they have a certain level of requirement of which they, they, as part of their remediation plan. So when the, remedi the final remediation plan is brought forward to, um, for, for the South Parcel, Arizona State Mines will have to sign off on that. And that will bring it to whatever condition they require. And that is the condition by which they can require. Will it be back to desert state, meaning will you see um, swaros and you know, will, will revegetation be, be required in that area? No, it would probably not be required is my guess. Um, they, they don't have to revegetate it. They will have to put it back in a condition as Chris is saying so that a future developer coming into the area would have um, you know, the walls knocked down, it would be safe, it would have all of those remediation requirements in there per Arizona State Mine Inspector's Office. So it will be scarred land, if that's what you're asking. I would imagine it's going to be scarred um, and, and appear as though there was something there at some time that's now been knocked down and flattened and, and, and made into, but it, it's not going to be revegetated, would be my guess. Okay, so... We're for the areas outside of the property line here. Because within the property line, they're going to have to figure out where the homes are going to go. They're going to have to vegetate, landscape, all the things that you would normally see as part of a development. But a portion of the mine is just to the west of that south parcel. And that portion of the mine would be remediated to the standard by which the Arizona State Mine Inspector Office requires. OK. And so. And so the, the portion of the mine that is on the parcel, the south parcel, will be revegetated and will be restored to a desert condition. Yeah, they're, and, they're going to want to be able to put as many homes and landscaping and other things that they would, you would normally see in a typical subdivision there. Yes. Okay, and so the land outside of their parcel, they will not have to do that, and I understand that. That's correct. So I wanted to just make sure that the land within their parcel, even though it's going to be open space, is still going to be uh, restored to a desert state. That's a good question to have maybe you guys, because there is maybe a small portion that's considered open space. See a lot of green there. I'm sorry, what's that? 
Yes, Mayor, would you prefer me to finish my presentation or would you like to have the applicant address this question now or? Yes, if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Susan Demet with Gamage and Burnham. Uh, I'm going to make a couple remarks about your question and then I'm going to have Andy, Bur Andy Barron with ABLA um, talk a little bit in more detail. So the, the difference between the initial mitigation plan, which is the safety measures that we're going to implement with the first within mm -hmm. the first 90 days and what um, it will be entailed in the final mitigation plan. It's, you know, they're apples and oranges. The final mitigation plan, in our view, is effectively going to represent the ultimate development plan for that property. And so the South Par Parcel is being planned as a master plan, you know, residential community similar to the North Parcel. We will have to remediate and mitigate that mine condition to a state that um, people are going to want to live in and around it. We expect that it will be integrated into the community as open space. I'm going to have a, Andy has already done a little bit of, they've done some studies and some initial planning. Um, you know, nothing is certain at this point in time. Mattamy does not have the South Parcel under contract, but they have been doing some analysis for the property owner as to how that piece may develop. So we have some ideas. But that won't get finalized until we do the final mitigation plan, which will be approved by both the state mine inspector's office and city staff. I mean, that has to come through as part of our development plans for the South Parcel. That final mitigation plan is essentially an element of the final development plan for that. So Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the planning work you've done? Mayor, members of the council, uh, Andy Barron with ABLA. I'm the land planner, landscape architect on the project. Chris is correct. We have done some preliminary studies in terms of trying to understand uh, what we would want for the entitlements. So as we've looked at the South Parcel, uh, there's a large amount of earth movement that's occurred. It's not probably likely that we would fill in all of that area, uh, but we have studied the edge conditions. We have identified areas that we think that can be fully filled and mitigated. The areas that we're not touching we have planned as park space. Uh, some of that will be landscaped and fully planted. Other areas would likely be hydro seeded or uh, mitigated with some other type of, of landscape treatment that, that could grow back over time. Uh, but it is a large area. Uh, the bigger concern, obviously, as Susan's pointed out, is to make sure that we've created a condition that people want to live around. So it's not our desire to leave it as a massive um, scar, I mean, there's no really better term for that, right? Uh, scarred earth, but it really is only going to be occurring on the property that that home builder would buy. If it's mad at me, we think we know what we'll do with it. If it's somebody else, um, there's enough information that we've created that it would likely continue down that same path. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. It does, it does, it okay. helps quite a bit. Um, is that, do, do, do our design, design standards, I mean, is there anything that oversees this kind of thing in the, in the long run for the city, in the city of Peoria? Mayor and Council, um, not specific to mines, but we have design standards for subdivisions that deal with landscaping and connectivity and, and all those things that we see, but nothing specific to mines. We don't have that many abandoned mines in a city. So yeah, this was a new news. one. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a lake though, don't we? <laughs> You're right. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that information. I appreciate knowing that there's gonna be as much mitigation as can be possible, at least to sell homes. <laughs> thank you. Oops. Well, thank you, Katie, Susan, and Andy. So this is the last slide I have, and this is the, um, these are the findings and recommendation that the staff and city council identified. So um, the uh, rezone we've, we've concluded conforms with the general plan. As I stated, the general plan has long designated this area for single family and open space. The gross density of three units per acre conforms with the range of two to five units per acre. The development standards we believe will maintain the area's character and development pattern as lot sizes are comparable to what's in the area. The proposal exceeds the city's minimum open space requirements. As I indicated, one third of the property will be in open space. Um, we've identified that all the necessary infrastructure will be in place to support the development at the timing it's required. And then finally, we do have a signed Proposition 207 waiver from the applicant. So with that, the recommendation is to approve the ordinance 2012 to rezone the uh, 200 acres from Suburban Ranch to the PAD, subject to the revised conditions um, in, your staff, in your staff report, Exhibit 1. And with that, we'll take any additional questions. Thank you. Councilor, are there any questions? Or, Councilmember Dunn? 
I don't know if um, I heard the this answer um, or understand it, so I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, as far as the mitigation on that south parcel, will that take place before or after the sale of that parcel? Um, Mayor, Council Member Dunn, the inner mitigation, which is the safety protocols, that'll take place within 90 days of if we take action tonight. The final remediation will take place when the south parcel develops. So that that would be likely after a sale of the south parcel. So if they didn't have a sale, would they not be required to mitigate or change the property back and, and fill, for the, fill it? For the final mitigation, that would occur when the south parcel is ready to develop. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay, so I want to thank the applicants for being here this evening. This uh, has been a little bit of a haul. It didn't come real easy, did it? Um, but I appreciate all the effort in working with staff and the public process and the, the mining operation. Um, and Chris, Mr. Hawkes, <laughs> fantastic job, really. This is so complicated. Um, and there's so many moving parts to this project, and you and your team have done a fantastic job of uh, understanding this and protecting the city and protecting the citizens um, and helping me to understand this. And I really appreciate all that has gone into this and your ability to present it to council the way you have. And um, I, I, I know that some additional letters came forward today. I, I um, did not know that we had additional letters, but I think uh, the focus is on the two-story homes, and I just want to, correct me if I'm wrong, the way the current zoning was, it allowed for two-story homes. Um, under the new zoning, we still have two-story, single-story, um, a mix, but we've protected the perimeter with, those, with the buffer and the one-story restrictions. Um, in all of the developments in that area, we've gone through this process, we've not um, deemed it, I guess, reasonable to request or single-story homes throughout the entire development. And um, that's how it exists in Trilogy, but not in, this, um, in these communities that are um, family communities, non-age restric restricted communities. Um, is that correct? Mayor, Councilmember Benzbecker, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Another thing I want to point out quickly is that that Dysart Road access behind Trilogy has forever been such a challenge for that community as far as all of the ATV vehicles going along that area. And and I have been, I feel like I've been saying forever, and Mayor probably forever before that, um, development will eventually take care of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe we've gotten to that point where development is going to take care of that and really um, create a more peaceful back, backyard situation for a lot of those residents. Um, so that's good news. But it has been quite a process, and I think we have um, listened to the citizens and made changes and, and requirements to this project that are in their best interest. Um, with that, if no one else has any other questions, Mayor, I would make a motion. Thank you. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second, and um, I would also like to thank the developer uh, for creating one-third of this site to be open space. That area is so beautiful, and the, the character needs to be maintained, and it looks like you have incorporated that beautiful Sonoran Desert in your development, so I appreciate that. Thank you. With that, Council, please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. We will now move on to item 29R, grant the recycling partnership contamination reduction. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. Uh, recycling service has been offered here in the city of Peoria since 2007 and is an important part of our sustainability mission. And in order to increase our focus on proper separation of recyclables and reduce the contamination in our recycle bins, uh, we have Public Works Director Kevin Burke who will present 
a pilot awareness project for your consideration. So this is an action item, and I'll pass it to Mr. Burke. Great. Thank you, Manager Tyne, Mayor Council. Thanks. Understand this is your last item on the regular agenda, so we'll move it right along. Uh, this is a, as it notes, a, a, a grant for recycling partnership and uh, reducing contamination. Let me just get a li little bit of context to this grant. Uh, you'll remember we talked about the China sword. This was a policy that the Chinese implemented that changed, that changed really the entire recycling industry and started limiting what products they would take at all. Um, the products they would take had to be uh, essentially 99.5% pure, so out, no contamination in them. As a result, the value of these commodities dropped significantly. The chart doesn't quite say it, but to the left of July 2018, if you went into 2017, you would see that line well north of $70 a ton. You can see at the last quarter of last year, we're down to $25 a ton. So the market has significantly dropped. As a result, across the country, we've seen a lot of municipalities either suspend or terminate their recycling services. In the state of Arizona, uh, there's nine cities that are on some sort of suspension, including Surprise, Mesa, and Casa Grande. Others have reacted by reducing frequencies, such as Tucson going to every other week to do recycling. Uh, and others have still changed which products they take to, again, keep it as simple as possible and reduce that contamination. The city of Peoria, and I'm sorry, let me pause it. I've not introduced my colleague here. I just jumped right in because I was so anxious to finish. Um, this is Aaron Red. He is our solid waste manager and uh, a key contributor to all of these activities. He will, I can get you about two inches deep into the water. He'll get you all the way through the deep end when we get there. So um, going forward, back to the, the recycling environment, we really were on a mission to make our recycling program more resilient in these difficult times. And thanks to people like Aaron Red, Stephen Sandoval, and Becky Borquez, uh, they put together this action plan for us to move forward with and really curb contamination. As a result, we've taken on a lot of really fun and exciting things. There's a whole host here, starting with the uh, million dollar investment in new uh, infrastructure. I'll just take a moment on that to say, this is now in place and is really paying dividends. We have seen, um, once this went into effect, about 32% more material that we can pull out of the contamination and sell. So that makes the value extremely high. And some of our highest products like aluminum, cardboard, newspaper, uh, they're able to pull those out in much higher percentages. And again, those have the value in today's market and so it's really making, uh, making a comeback. We've updated our website. Uh, the handsome devil in the bottom left, the dog, that is our, uh, Aaron Red has done our voiceover. Who knew he was so talented in other ways? But uh, this is a great video that's on our website that talks about how to recycle right. Um, our inspection program, the wraps that you've seen on our trucks now are out and about uh, bringing our education right to people's doorsteps. So these are all ways that we are trying to improve our uh, resiliency in this. The next phase that we are looking at is this idea of a blue lid pilot. And what this came about is that as we were doing some of our different programs, particularly the inspection program, we heard some confusion still about which container am I supposed to be putting the recycling in. Obviously blue is kind of the international standard for recycling, but we've done a lot of hard work in Peoria and building our communities a little bit more aesthetically pleasing than a bright blue container in front of everybody's house. Uh, so the thought was, well, what if we compromised and looked at just a blue lid? Would that make any difference? And so um, found a partner with the Recycling Partnership as a granting agency who said, you know, we're seeing that same question asked throughout the country. We'd be very interested in partnering with you to see what are the results and make sure that they're transferable. So we're willing to put in half the money to buy the lids. So this is $35,000 each roughly to buy the lids. But the real value of the grant is closer to about $175,000 because they are bringing personnel to help with our audits before and after to measure contamination, providing educational material, providing consulting, et cetera. So it really increases the overall value of this. But one of the other things that they've really insisted is the scientific process and making sure that we are doing something that is isolating the different variables and making sure that whatever results we have are something that can be repeated in other parts of the country and that we have something we can stand behind. Our timeline for this grant would be from January to June would be the implementation phase and um, 
that would include both uh, getting the materials, doing an audit before the experiment is put in place, and then doing an audit afterwards. The other piece that's really not noted here, but while we're experimenting with the blue lid is how it curbs contamination, it's also an experiment to understand is this aesthetically tolerable in our neighborhoods, and so we want to you know, get feedback at the end of the grant to understand can we live with this kind of compromise if it makes a difference. So with that, our um, recommendation is to enter the contract for a pilot program. We would then conduct it and then determine if any operational policy changes based on the results. I leave it there for any questions and uh, Mr. Red is also here to help us with that. That sounds like a really great and smart program. Good job getting all of that money <laughs> to help with this. Certainly, accolades to the staff. Everybody's pointing to someone else. Oh, Becky. <laughs> Becky, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Really, really great program. And I like the blue lids. Great. I, I think, you know, we've needed some differentiation for a long time. Everybody understands what blue means. So I'm really happy to see this. Council, are there any comments or questions? No. Council well, Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, where's, is this a citywide pilot or is it a regional? Are you, Targeting a certain area to fair to point, this? right? It, it's actually pretty small. Um, so there, we have 50 recycle routes. Um, this would be across four of them. One is the control group. So really, it's across three. One is just before and after. Has anything changed? Um, the second route is just looking at educational material. The third route would be the educational material and the blue lid. And the fourth route would be the educational material, the blue lid, and the inspection program. So that's the, the variable. So really it's just two um, routes out of 50. Thank you. And yet, Council Member Dunn? What, uh, where will the routes be that the, with the blue lids? Where, where will that be situated? I, we're primarily in the northern part of the city of Peoria. Again, one of the things that the granting agency was looking for was to get four routes that were as similar as possible so that we had um, as few other variables that came into place. So these are primarily uh, all north of Happy Valley. So if they replace the um, lids in the northern part, um, then I'm assuming if it works out well, they'll do it citywide? I, you know, that would be a decision that we'd have to come back and talk about. We need to just get the results and understand, again, not only how well did it curb the contamination issue, but how tolerable was the um, change in pr presentation in the barrels. So if, the, if, if it's rolled out citywide, would, they, would the grant cover some of that cost as well? I'll turn to, I, I don't believe so, but I'll ask Mr. Red. Good evening, Mayor Council. So uh, Council Member Dunn, uh, the partnership has said that if this is successful in these pilot areas, they would be open to discuss and even um, funding some of uh, the um, deployment of the, of the containers citywide. And then I had one last question. In the uh, north, let's say they don't like the aesthetics of it. Who would um, pay to replace the lids back? So that is that would be part of our overall um, container costs. You know, we have a budget for containers each year, and so we would be looking at restoring them. Again, you know, we're going to keep the containers. We're not throwing them out or recycling them. So it would be a matter of going back and reinstalling them back onto the bins. Thank you, and and I I do also want to thank um, each and every one of you for the hard work on this too, because I know grants are not easy to come by. So, um, and, and I know we are getting a, a good um, blended rate, you know, the cleaner the material is, and that does help. Um, so I appreciate all the hard work. You guys have done a fantastic job on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Pretty amazing turning $35,000 grant into a $174,000 grant. Magicians, and you can sound like a dog too on a video, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to hear that video, I'll bet it's great. All right, do I have a motion? I have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. Passes unanimously. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your support. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. If you wish to address the City Council, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. And I have received no speaker request forms, so now we will move on to reports from City Manager, Mr. Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I have two items that we wanted to go through today. And first off is to offer you a, a, an update on the city's response to the economic and health events that have occurred related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we wanted to provide you an update on that. So you've heard quite a bit on the city's initial response to the immediate crisis. Uh, while we are still in what is officially an early phase and all of us are still vulnerable, the metrics fortunately are trending in the right direction. For us as a city and as an organization, we are starting to migrate from uh, managing through our initial crisis management mode to more of supporting the period of the next six months. And so what we wanted to do is provide from you a few of our different presenters to talk a little bit about the conditions in the business community as we see it and our approach to that. Uh, discuss a little bit of the changing needs we see of our residents, uh, for example, parents of school-aged children, and how we will be uh, responding overall uh, and maintaining our resilience as an organization. So with that, I'll pass this over first to, uh, we have, uh, I think, Jay Davies, our Chief of Staff at the City Manager's Office, as well as Eric Strunk and Katie Gregory, our Deputy City Managers. I'll pass it first to Mr. Davies. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we have several teams monitoring metrics, conditions, and state and local directives. Uh, in Peoria, most uh, of our areas are trending at or below the Arizona case rates, with, of course, 85345 tracking higher, but still showing signs of leveling off uh, with respect to, to cases. Based on all of this, here's a quick rundown on the status of our facilities first. Uh, Rio Vista Rec Center closed uh, in July, and at this point, uh, not only for the gym, but the facility itself, staff is looking at the state's process for gyms to determine how best to move forward, so more to come on that. Parks and trails remain open uh, with the exception of tournament play. However, this weekend, we start a limited pilot for tournament, uh, tournament play that will take place at Rio Vista Park uh, under thoughtful safety guidelines. Playgrounds remain open, although with the heat that we're experiencing right now, they're not getting a lot of use. Uh, and restrooms remain open in all of the parks. Uh, the community center, moving over there, that also remains closed to the public. Uh, however, meal programs are continuing on a delivery basis. And the community action program and our not-for-profit partners are assisting clients by appointment only. Uh, here at City Hall, uh, the facilities and service counters remain open to the public during normal business hours, with the exception of engineering, which delivers most of its services electronically and can be accessed by phone or appointment as well. Uh, some things that we're doing uh, in addition to kind of make up and close some gaps uh, to further support students and parents with online schooling challenges. This week, the Peoria Public Library, both Maine and Sunrise Mountain, opened its computer labs uh, for public use, increasing its operating hours, uh, putting a total of 28 computers over both locations to be available, uh, printing and copying services. You can check out uh, Wi-Fi uh, hotspots to help with connectivity. Uh, and our amazing youth librarians are available to assist with the challenges of home-based learning, which uh, a lot of parents now are, are finding is their reality. Moving to public safety, uh, across both fire and police, we're finding that calls for service that are COVID-related are very low. Uh, the fire department is responding to fewer than two of these per week, uh, whereas earlier in, in the pandemic, it was, it was at least twice as high, it's averaged about four uh, over, the, over the course of the pandemic, certainly higher at the beginning. Uh, as a result, the exposure rate, our first responders being exposed to COVID, that rate is, is dropping uh, as well. And uh, as a result, the fire department has not had to deploy recently the additional uh, alternative response unit. So all good news there on the public safety front. And then internally, the organization as a whole, uh, we are practicing social distancing, utilizing barriers, much as what, what you see between yourselves, uh, and mass protocols. These are all working very well. And as a result, our workforce uh, exposures remain very much in line with the rate of the general Arizona population. So with that, uh, that concludes my portion. 
Great, I'll jump into the next part. Is I, It's hard to believe it's been a couple months since we last updated you in the community on everything we're doing with what we call supplemental services. I'm not gonna go over every single one of these, um, probably thank goodness at this point in time, <laughs> But what I did want to do is highlight a couple of these. I think they're, they're really neat, and it shows how the community has kind of come together a little bit on these. Um, the first, uh, the arts, arts grants that you see up there, just wanted to let you all know you approved that in June, and we delivered as we said we would. I really want to thank the um, Mary Lou Stevens and the rest of the special events and arts division for processing those very quickly, and of course the citizen volunteers that helped out in reviewing the applications. There's been several grab and grows, grab and goes. You'll recall that we had several restaurants in Peoria that wanted to try to give back to the community as best as they could. And through partnering with the Neighborhood and Human Services staff, we uh, basically set aside space in parks and other facilities where that occurred. And you'll see a couple of those up there. Um, one of the neat things that's happened, and it's really kind of almost in Kay's area, but the Chamber of Commerce has also chosen to get a little busy uh, with respect to providing and collaborating with businesses that have space for students that need access to technology, that need to drop in and do homework or do reading. And there are a few businesses. It's kind of one of those slow growth efforts that's occurring. Um, you, you don't see that too often. It's just really, really neat to see that occur in Peoria, and I wanted to kind of tip the hat to that. Um, Jay had mentioned additional uh, hours at the library. Um, Nathaniel um, and, and the library team deserve credit for that. They managed to increase uh, access to technology at both facilities. And additionally, um, we, we were able to use some of the CARES Act money that you provided to us to purchase Wi-Fi hotspots, and that has resulted in a really neat collaboration with the Peoria Unified School District and other school districts as we develop those relations to get those out to students who may have the hardware, but the family may not be able to afford access to the technology to get them to submit their, their homework and everything else. Finally, a uh, couple, couple quick notes. Um, the last two items on the bullet points there, we're really, really happy and wanted to thank Chief Reese from our fire department, um, Kelly Kincaid from Neighborhood and Human Services, John Sefton and his team at the sports complex, they kind of all came together and worked to see how we could perhaps bring some free testing to Peoria for, for COVID. And um, we're kind of happy to announce it's a little preliminary, but it's all coming together on September 4th and 5th, a um, couple days uh, at the sports complex, there'll be free testing available. And that's through actually Maricopa County. They're, they're paying the costs through monies they have of their own. We're providing the venue, but I wanted to thank those individuals for kind of seizing that opportunity. Lastly, um, you'll see it probably at the next council meeting, um, something for action, for consideration. Um, rent and mortgage assistance in addition to utility assistance. You gave us a million and a half dollars uh, at the last meeting. We've been very methodical and we've identified a nonprofit and uh, we will be bringing that for you for consideration uh, at the September 8th meeting. Um, really, again, it's a lot of different individuals using a lot of different resources and in our corner of the world, supplemental services, we think we're doing a, a fairly good job and just really wanted to thank everyone, yourselves included, for helping us get this far along. Katie? Or, yeah, Katie? Yeah, yeah, thanks, oh, go back one. Don't, you're spoiling, you're spoiling my, my stuff here, Jay. Um, <laughs> first of all, I'd like to just uh, they say hello to council. Thank you guys for all the support that you've had for Peoria Small Businesses. Um, since our last update in June, we've continued with our Peoria Small Business Task Force meeting regularly to really try to implement a lot of the programs and services that we've been trying to, uh, that we've talked with you about in June and that, um, you know, we wanted to get in place. Uh, in July, we were able to launch our second round of our banner program. Um, some of you may see those around, the green banners that say we're open or we're open virtually. Um, those were really developed to help highlight all the healthy business practices that businesses are following and kind of highlight those who are really following the CDC guidelines and, and recommendations and adjusting to those new requirements in their businesses. We also, as part of that, provided what we call tabletops, postcards, and signage to help businesses who, um, to help businesses have ways for customers to reach out to them 
um, versus maybe going on other platforms to um, complain or things like that. So to bring any complaints or issues or concerns they have with um, what's happening in the business, if they see anything, if you see it, let the business owner know. That's kind of our message there. But what I'd really like to talk to you about um, tonight, and, and Jen's going to talk about some of our um, communications efforts that we've had that have been supporting businesses, but I don't want to steal her thunder. But what I really want to talk to you about tonight um, is the uh, launch of our Peoria Small Business Relief Grant. Um, we have been working very hard over the break to find a um, third-party administrator, which we did with the Arizona Community Foundation, who has a good uh, track record working on these types of programs and does a good job of getting funding out for grants, loans, scholarships, all different types. And they've also um, got a track record working with Phoenix with their IDA that was a small business grant as well as with what many of you may be aware of is the, the Maricopa County grant that's a business relief grant that's out right now um, that all of our businesses should be looking at. So if they haven't, they should be looking at that. But we are now putting out our Just for City of Peoria businesses, our small business relief grant. So um, some quick facts, because I, there's a lot of information uh, about it, but some quick facts for me. To, it, it is a grant program that's designed to provide the much needed financial assistance to a large segment of our businesses. So it, the criteria will not count, include everyone, but the major, majority of our businesses should fall under these, this criteria. Um, the eligible business and nonprofit organizations, so both, both for-profit and nonprofit organizations, can apply for grants up to $20,000 to help with rent, utility, uh, utilities, and co any COVID-related equipment or supplies. So if they're having to gear themselves up or they're having other expenditures that they maybe hadn't had in the past that now they're having to, um, to uh, purchase, then this, this is a grant that they really should be looking at. Um, beginning at noon tomorrow, so that's the big exciting news, is that tomorrow the grant launches. It opens at noon. Um, you, people will, the, our businesses and our not-for-profits will be able to access an online portal um, and an online application, and it will be both at what's listed here, the Arizona Foundation site, www.arizonafoundation.org, Peoria Relief. We will also have a link to that from the city's Doing Business in Peoria site. So they can go to either the city or they can go to Arizona Community Foundation and find that application. Um, as mentioned before, the eligibility criteria was really designed to meet the characteristics of our business community. This is our, our group of um, businesses and, and not-for-profits in the city. And some of the basic criteria that we have is that they must be located in the city. This is for City of Peoria businesses and in operation for the last 12 months. They must have 25 or fewer employees and less than $3 million in gross revenues. They must have a valid business license and have experienced, have experienced at least a 25% decline in revenue. Those are basic pieces which I think, unfortunately, many of our businesses <laughs> fall into that situation. So we're really encouraging everyone to apply for this grant. Um, we want them to reach out if they have any questions on their eligibility or any anything. They can reach out to the city through the city's web pages, or they can reach out or they can reach out through the Arizona Community Foundation. All of us, we've got a team of, of folks that are both at the Community Foundation as well as um, with the city. We've got teams ready to answer questions. So um, if anything comes through, if it comes to Peoria from the Arizona Community Foundation, it'll be a, 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 an email sent to us that we will then triage and send out and get back to them within an hour or so. So that's, that's our, our uh, pledge for this. Um, and go ahead and go to the next one. I do want to just mention there are a few questions that have already come up, and I know anyone watching at home is probably saying to themselves, this doesn't apply to me. This grant, you know, I've tried for all these other grants. We've been in this, in this deal for the last four months, and, you know, every time I go to try to apply for something, for some reason, I'm not eligible. I want to say, come talk to us. If you're a Peoria business and you need some financial assistance, come and talk to us. You may be eligible, you may not know you're eligible. Many other grants in the state have not allowed anyone who received any other funding, any other stimulus funding, any other types of funding to apply for grants. That is not the case here. If you've received PPP, EIDL, small business bridge loans, any of those types of things that were part of the federal stimulus package, you are still eligible for a Peoria grant if you, follow, if you fall within that criteria. So please come and talk to us. Um, 
If they, uh, if we also have uh, that if they're, if they're a home-based business, which we all know we have a lot of home-based businesses in Peoria, sole proprietorships, those are all eligible to apply for this grant. So you don't have to have five or more employees. You need to have at least one person in a business um, that you're running and operating and you'll be eligible for this grant if you, if you meet the criteria. And then um, wanna just also say different than other grants that we've seen, our funding will be allowed to pay for past due rent and utilities and other costs if they have receipts and, and they can be reimbursed for costs that they've had to incur. It also can be used for future rent utilities and um, future costs that they're gonna have. So that's a little different than some of those other grants. So I wanted to point those out because I think those are really important and, and what we're hearing is that a lot of people don't think that they are eligible for these types of funding programs. We want you to come and at least look at our program because we think if you're a Peoria business, we're, we're here to help. So our motto right now is a million dollars in a month. That's what we're trying to get out is one million dollars in a month to our Peoria businesses and not for profits. Our, our grant is open from tomorrow until September 18th and it's, it's first come, first serve. Get your name in there, get your application in there, and um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to serve a lot of our businesses that are in need right now. And lastly, I wanted to um, mention that uh, in the year 2020, information is just key. And having both our residents and businesses to have awareness and a chance to engage is, is so critical too. So with that, I wanted to pass it to Ms. Stein, uh, our communications director, to talk a little bit about our approach and the use of our CARES money there. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The Office of Communication immediately um, coordinated an outreach effort for our business community to show support. And initially, when we created Weren't It Together, it was really to encourage shopping virtually, because that was during the time when the executive order had shut down a number of businesses. So we were encouraging takeout and delivery and supporting and um, shopping local. Once the businesses started to reopen again, we created a and I'm not sure if you saw it, but open for business video campaign series. And this was really successful because it allowed um, us to showcase what safety protocols businesses had in place to create a safer environment. So that was kind of the initial plan was show our support, increase exposure, and feature as many businesses as we could through our social media platforms and traditional ones as well, including our web and media. Now we're in the process of selecting a marketing and advertising agency who will conduct consumer research initially. And this is important because we need to find out, along with businesses, and we received feedback from the mayor's task, the small business task force, saying we need to know what are consumers feeling right now? Where, what are the habits? What are their perceptions during this pandemic? What is impacting their decision making? And how can businesses accommodate consumers during this time and post pandemic? What, what can we do to accommodate or what can they do to accommodate and how can we support that? So first there's gonna be uh, research and then what the findings, when they come back, that will help shape and build a very creative and robust campaign, advertising campaign, that we will just paint the town with this campaign red and really encourage people to get out there, you know, support, save, um, visit, and hopefully just continue to share all the offerings our business community is making available. Thank you. Thank you uh, again. If there's any questions regarding our uh, approach as we have that, and uh, we uh, strongly encourage our residents to visit our website as well as look at our social media or engage us anywhere in the city uh, for assistance on that. Thank uh, you. One last item that we had, I wanted to briefly talk and, and switch gears, if I may, uh, to uh, Peoria, and it's our fire boat and the assistance that we are able to provide there. So a point of pride that we have in the, the Valley of the Sun region is the incredible coordination that we have with our first responders and especially is illustrated with our automatic aid agreements that we have. To help illustrate this, Fire Chief Bobby Reese will present a short video highlighting a recent assistance that we provided to the city of Tempe. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, on July 29th, that was an Oak Creek Canyon vacationing. About six o'clock in the morning, and I get this uh, dispatch notification on my phone that there was a train de derailment over the Tempe Town Lake. I turn on the TV, 
just to see what looked like a tabletop exercise from hell. It, it, uh, on the south end, where it derailed, you had a, a, a rail tanker with about 34,000 gallons of a flammable liquid that was leaking into the atmosphere. And just north of that was a fire that was working north over the bridge that was uh, rails full of lumber, packed with lumber. At the end of that, the north side was two other tankers that had chemicals that were di diametrically opposed to each other and about 34,000 gallons a piece. And if they, those would have mixed and had problems with, there would be no bridge. So I'll let the video speak for itself and I'll answer any questions you may have. Fireboat 199, Battalion 191, Fire Channel A7, assist units for a third alarm train fire. Farmer and University at Tempe Town Lake, Engine 199, Fireboat 199, Battalion 191, Fire Channel A7. Early on Tuesday, July 29th, a southbound Union Pacific train derailed on the southern end of a bridge crossing Tempe Town Lake. The derailment caused a fire that quickly spread, consuming rail cars, their content, and the wood railroad ties that supported the track. The incident would eventually generate a fourth alarm hazardous material response. Early in the incident, Tempe Fire Chief Greg Reese called Peoria Fire Medical Chief Bobby Reese requesting the deployment of Fireboat 199 from Lake Pleasant to Tempe Town Lake. We were able to utilize a fireboat through the automatic aid system with the help of Peoria Fire Department. I made a call er earlier this morning to Peoria's fire chief, asked if they could deploy their fireboat. We are in an automatic aid system, and the city of uh, Peoria, through the fire chief, quickly um, answered my call. And they deployed their asset from Lake Pleasant, and we had it in the water, and it's done some amazing work for us. Support services personnel immediately responded to Lake Pleasant to meet up with a crew of Fireboat 199 to transport the boat to Tempe. Peoria Fire Medical personnel safely transported the boat and had it deployed into the water in under 60 minutes. Upon arrival, Fireboat 199 was assigned to Lake Sector. Prior to Fireboat 199's arrival, crews were able to put water on the north and south ends of the bridge but were unable to access the rail cars in the center of the bridge. A majority of the rail cars were filled with lumber, but they were a few tanker cars containing hazardous material in the center of the bridge, making it a high priority to protect those rail cars. After 10 hours of operation, Fireboat 199 was able to extinguish the fire on the lumber cars, preventing the fire spread to the tanker cars. The two tanker cars contained sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. On Friday, July 31st, Fireboat 199 was requested again to Tempe Town Lake to assist in the continued operations, and the crews were able to once again make a significant contribution in mitigating the disaster. Thank you. Wait, don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Council, any comments? Questions for Chief? Councilmember Dunn. I just want to thank you for all the hard work, and, and I can't tell you how proud it, it is for me to, to see this on the news, social media, to see our department doing this. And I also wanted to um, mention a thank you, too, to I know Tahoda Odom Nation helped us get this boat. So a, a big thank you to them for helping us do the job that we do as well. But thank you so much for what, all your hard work. I appreciate you. Absolutely, my not my hard work is is our is our troops. Is is it look? They make it look real easy, but it it takes a lot of training, a lot of practice because the water actually creates a big turbine, and it moves the boat all around and everything. And if you don't train on it to to keep it still in the water in one particular place, you can whip around all over the place. Mm -hmm. Are, are we the only city with a fireboat? Yes. Wow, that makes me so proud. And did you just stay on vacation in uh, <laughs> <laughs> And not answer my phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and is there any connection between Captain Greg Reese and... Chief Reese and Reese, Reese, and Reese? no. 
He uh, calls me grandpa from time to time, and, <laughs> and, and I, I say that he's my, actually my illegitimate kid, but uh, there, there's no truth to that. Thank you. Well, I, did, I just also wanted to thank you. Please thank everybody involved in this. It was just very uh, amazing to turn on the TV and, and see Peoria firefighters out there doing what they do so well. We had no idea, though, that there could have been an, an ecological disaster had they not been there. And so it's pretty incredible to know that. It was hard to think I could have been more proud, but I am now more proud. So thank you very much. Let them know how much we appreciate them. And, and that comment, uh, that was their uh, analysis. So not ours, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chief Reese, sporting and accessorizing very nicely tonight, by the way. <laughs> that, that is all we have for our staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is really great. And, and I appreciate everything that, that all of your teams are doing uh, with regard to the relief for our small businesses. Um, that is really great. And so everybody, I hope that you heard anyone who's watching from home that tomorrow the portal opens for small business grants at noon. So go to the city's website and look for that. Uh, I also just wanted to say that tonight on our um, consent agenda, we approved the canvas of the election that just happened at the beginning of this month. And uh, we have three council members sitting right here who just got reelected. Council member Patena, council member Binsbacher, and council member Edwards um, have just gotten four more years. Welcome to the struggle again. <laughs> so, I mean, it is, I, I just really have to thank the citizens, the residents of the city of Peoria for keeping our council together. This continuity makes a big difference in accomplishing the vision that we have for the city of Peoria. So thank you for the confidence that you have shown in our city council. And I also would like to thank our new Council Youth Liaisons uh, this evening, and that is Council Youth Liaison Tuwari and Van Winkle. Tuwari and Van Winkle, <laughs> we welcome you to the Peoria City Council and to our dais. And we will look forward to seeing you every other Tuesday. <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned. Um, and more specifically, um, the access to a major transportation corridor, more specifically uh, Grand Avenue, uh, supports the